is it going to be a problem for you on YouTube if I roll a fag, or should I do that very quickly beforehand? Uh, not at all, mate. I mean, it's it's entirely you, mate. If it's your character, it's your character. Don't worry about it. It's uh, very, very organic, this podcast. Brilliant. I, I've, I've only caught little sections of it, and I'm really sorry I haven't had time to go for a Don't full worry. episode yet. I watched your, I watched your clips. It was thanks to you. Um, well, I mean, I, we we can talk about this as well if you like. It's thanks to you that I found the machine shop. And uh, oh wow, cool! I'm, actually go, I'm going up there next week. I met Bob at the MCN, so oh. I saw him on your program, and I messaged him, and I was like, "Oh, hey, buddy, I really like the sound of what you're doing. Don't know if you see my videos. I do these dumb things where I say I don't know what I'm doing and do stuff, and you seem perfect for me." And he messaged me right back, going, "Dude, I'm a really big fan." <laughs> and I yeah. Was like, yeah. He's a top man, Bob, isn't he? You'd be right up his Straza. Right up his Straza. Yeah. We, we, we met at the MCN and got on very well. Awesome. Awesome. Right, um, I reckon I, I we... Pro- Sorry, go on. I was just going to say, I think I'm good, buddy. I'm, I'm, I'm ready when you are. Right, I, I think we've pretty much started this anyway. I'll, I'll figure a starting point along where we've been. Uh, folks, Guy Markham, how you doing, pal? Hey, uh, I'm doing very well. Uh, still... Uh, Still enjoying uh, everything that's happened because of this. Mate, you are on, well, from what seems to an outsider like me, you seem to be on a momentous whirlwind at the moment, like this huge rise to social media fame and acclaim almost. Wow, how are you doing it? Uh, I don't don't know how I do it. I I literally... (laughs) Uh, I started doing this. It was kind of a bit of a joke. At start, like uh, for, for anyone who's not familiar with me, I, I used to run the security teams for film and TV shoots. And then during the writer's strike, my work disappeared. And I have this lovely off-grid setup. So my overheads are really low. I was like, I can ride this out a little bit. We'll be fine. It was the middle of festival season. I was just going to festivals every weekend, having fun. And then it was like the strikes kept on going and kept on going. And I'd made one silly video at a festival and one of my friend's kids turned around to me and went, that was really funny. You should put that on TikTok or something. Yeah. And I'd never even had, I don't think I'd ever opened TikTok <laughs> or seen it as an app. I, like, I knew what it was. I was like, I'll give it a try. Uh, and it, it did well. And so what I did was I sort of secretly practiced on TikTok for about two months and got, got what I hope was most of my bad stuff out of the way. <laughs> And then someone shared one of my posts to Instagram and it just got loads. And I was yeah. like, all right, I need, to, I need to do this. And yeah, in my head, I was thinking maybe when I go back to work, I can have this as a little side thing. Maybe one, one day I'll get a sponsored helmet for when I go off traveling or something. Yeah. And, uh, and then, yeah, uh, you know, it just, it just hit and it just kept on growing. And then when the strikes were over, my contractor reached out to me and he said, I've got a job for you. Uh, it's good money. It comes with accommodation, which is really rare in that industry, by the way, um, for security anyway. Uh, and you can start next week. And I had to say to him, I was like, I, I think I'm going to keep doing this. Wow. Uh, and yeah, I, I just I just took a gamble. Like, you know, I, I made a bet on myself. And I was like, uh, this is going so well and it's growing so fast that it would be really stupid to walk away from this because I'd be going mm. like I used to work 70 to 90 hour weeks and mm. I wouldn't be able to fit this I, I might get one post out a week if I went back yeah. to doing that uh, if that um, and yeah I just like I thought no I'm going to try it and I, I had a really January sucked <laughs> like January was a lean month uh, and then it like I, I set up my fundraiser I explained what I wanted to do and I was expecting that to take a really long time uh, and in, in like uh, I think less than two weeks I had half the goal. I wow. got rid of the debt that I'd incurred while I'd been doing this. And I just, it, outside of like people donating money, just hundreds of messages of support from people saying, hey, we love what you're doing. Please keep doing it. We don't want you to stop doing it. And it was just, yeah, it was, it was a bit emotional, really. Um, yeah. It was, uh, yeah, it was, it, it's, it's been crazy. And then it, it's culminated to, as we were talking about just before we started, I've now leading my own tours uh, coming up soon, which is something I know you do. Uh, and mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm, I, I want to build longer form content uh, with YouTube. I got an invite to the MCN in London a couple of weeks ago. And just today, Royal Enfield sent me a Super Meteor 650 with the instructions, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> wow, um, makes you sick. <laughs> no, honestly. I'm like disgusted in myself. <laughs> no, 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 honestly. Yeah. Sometimes you just need to bet on yourself, don't you? You need to take that leap of faith. 
if, if, if it's something you really want to do, I've chatted about this ad nauseum on this podcast, but you, my motto is live your life. And I, I a hundred percent believe it. If, if you really Absolutely. believe in what you're doing and in you, and you know that this is something you can, you can do, you can achieve and attain, you just got to go for it. Cause if you don't go for it, it's never going to happen. I, 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 every single, I've got a lot of friends who are comedians, musicians, or mm. artists who work in some sort of creative industry. And I want all of them to not have a real job because they don't want real jobs. I don't want a real job. So I do this. And like, m when this started to grow, I kind of like, my plan had always been work hard enough so that I can have enough money to put into doing some really amazing motorcycle trips. And then there was just this little part of my brain that was like, just cut out the middle, man. If you can find a way, to like monetize just bikes and having fun. Like my two favorite things are riding bikes and talking about bikes and making people laugh and getting people to have fun. Like th th that would be great. And then I'm just like, well, if I can, if I can just do that in a way that I can support myself. And as I said earlier, I, I don't need much. I live in a caravan on the side of the cliff. Like I don't pay a lot to live here. My running costs are pretty low. If I've got food and my rent is paid and I've got fuel in the bike, I'm winning. Anything on top of that is a massive bonus. Yeah, actually, that that brings us on quite nicely here, guy. Folks, if you are listening to the podcast, you're probably hearing a little bit of an echo um, on Guy's side. I'll try and tweak that a little okay. bit in post. And if you're watching the video, well, you can see for yourself. Now, Guy, can you explain to us where you're currently located? <laughs> so uh, I live on the cliffs of the south coast of Cornwall. Um we call it a farm. Uh, we don't actually farm anything here. Uh, there's 72 acres. Uh, I'm a friend of the family. I went to school with one of the owner's sons. And um, we do sort of conservation stuff. So uh, I've just been looking after some Dartmoor ponies today um, that come and do winter grazing with us. Uh, it also helps manage the land. We've got a flock of sheep that we literally use as lawnmowers. Uh, the owner gets it in rare breeds. So the rare breeds grants pay for their upkeep. It doesn't really make any money for them, but... It keeps the place ticking over. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, as a young person, I um, her, her son is a computer programmer. Um, and even though he can do a lot of physical work, he's focused on the computer. And I used to turn up here when I was 16 with nothing to do all summer. And uh, I would come and help them with the sheep and build fences. And I slowly learned how to do a lot of different manual jobs on the land. So just kept on doing stuff. And I've I've lived on most of the weird patches of this land. I was in a bell tent for a while in one of the fields. I had a shed at the top of the garden that I lived in. And then a few years ago, someone gave me a caravan that they were using as a tool shed. Um, I just said, oh, would you like this? So I said, well, funnily enough, I've got a great place to put that. Um, and uh, at the same time that I got it, the owner said, Look, you know, I've, I've been here for nearly two decades, like on and off. Uh, I've, I've, I've done quite a bit of traveling and worked away a fair bit, but this has always been my base um she said would you like the stables like just like that's your area you do what you need to down there so they're, they're not mine on paper or anything but i have i have free reign on this little area to do what i want uh and uh actually um if, if do you mind me um caroline the owner of the land has got a business here do you mind me giving them a quick shout out no please do please do um, so um if you go to winsworth.org.uk you can see our coach house. Uh, it, like I, I don't make anything from this. This is all Caroline stuff. It's a completely off-grid experience. Um, so all the water is heated through the wood burner and the solar panels on the outside. There's We've got a whole solar uh, plumbing section. Uh, we've got a wood-fired hot tub outside. The view is incredible. If you've seen some of my videos on the days when the weather's good, we are, <laughs> we've got so much beautiful coastline to look along here. And it's just a, it's a beautiful experience. It's, it's really rustic and old from the outside. And you go inside, and this is really modern, beautifully decorated, but it's all wood and stone. And it's like, it, it's absolutely gorgeous. So, so if, uh, if that's the sort of thing that people are into, I highly recommend just Google Winsworth and you'll find us. Right, folks, there'll be links down below. So that's winsworth.org.uk. That's correct. Yeah. Beautiful. Links down below, folks. Make sure you check that out. Right. Okay. So. We didn't quite describe where you are. You are currently stood in a barn. <laughs> and... Sorry, I ramble a lot. You're going to have to rein me in every right. now and then. No worries. So you're stood in a barn, currently this lit by a torch. Room. Yeah, yeah. Um, th so this is this is my tack room. Um, uh, so I just, well, it was a tack room for the horse people. I keep all my tools and stuff in here. Um, uh, uh, my caravan's about 100 foot from where I'm standing right now. 
Um, I've got two ponies out in the yard, and yeah, it's a, it is a, um, it is a rural back end muddy part of Cornwall, and I, I couldn't think of anywhere better to call home. It's absolutely gorgeous here. Awesome, and you have what looks like a broadsword on the wall behind you. This did come up uh, the other day. <laughs> Actually, you um, I was telling you, you'll. Uh, you might have a few friends who are familiar with this particular style. It is a Scottish claymore. Yeah. Um, uh, so this was, I was best man for a friend of mine uh, a few years ago. And he said, apparently the, the tradition is to give the best man a sword as a present. It was come from the days when you would go and nick one of the neighboring tribes women to keep the gene pool diversified. <laughs> and they all turn up and try and nick her back. And it turns out what the, what the best man was supposed to do, the reason you wear the same suit is to confuse the neighboring tribe. So he's supposed to run off with the bride and then you whip out your sword and fight off the uh, the attackers. But uh, yeah, he did this I've really I've never nice heard bit. that before. Uh, I, one person has told me that. I don't know if it's true. I'm just repeating it because someone Sounds told me. Sounds amazing, mate. Sounds <laughs> awesome. But yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? But yeah, he said, uh, he, he gave me this really nice speech. He said, I don't know anyone more self-sufficient than you. And, you know, I've, my background's in private security. He said, I always feel safe with you. I don't know what you get for a person who doesn't actually need anything. Not want anything, just doesn't need anything. So I got you a hand-forged Scottish claymore. <laughs> he couldn't actually bring it to the wedding, and it lived in his mum's uh, cleaning cupboard for the first two years, because I was always on the road. But, yeah, now it hangs up proudly in my tongue rack. I-, I want a Scottish claymore now. I want yeah. one. <laughs> well, I know like, you can get you one, is it? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Guy. Before um, before we get into questions and and everything about life now, what brought you to where you are? I know you, you've given us a bit of a, the backstory there about you've worked in the you know in the insecurity and the, the film and the entertainment industry and stuff. But like, how, how did you get to that point? Who is Guy Martin? Uh, Guy, Guy Martin? Guy Martin? Um, Guy, yeah, you're not the only one to do that. <laughs> I had a very excited insurance uh, salesman when I was renewing my bike insurance. <laughs> who heard my name and started squealing like a little girl. They're just going, oh, my God. <laughs> um, but, yeah, corrected him. Um, so, I mean, uh, I, I, I will try not to go on too long because I do ramble, so cut me if I'm losing my thread. No worries. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I spent uh, I spent a lot of uh, – I went to a very weird school. I went to a, a hippie democratic school where there was no uniforms. Uh, students had the same voting rights as the teachers. Everything was decided in weekly meetings. Um, it, it was uh, it was curriculum education, but it was it gave you a very good sense of hey, you know what you say is important, which is great. But the trouble with that is you go into the real world as a sixteen year old thinking your opinion is important, and soon enough you find out it's not, and people <laughs> will tell you it's not. Uh, so I spent I spent my early years not really doing much. Um, I, I I probably spent a good ten years just getting stoned and working in cafes and bars, yeah. um, and then uh, I had a. I had an experience, which um, I believe one of the written down questions will cover. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll hold off on that one because I will okay, go on a tangent to tell you nice. that. Um, uh, we'll, we'll wait for that one. But um, yeah, I had an experience that kind of changed things for me. And then I was just like, I need to get the most out of life that I can. And I started taking jobs overseas. Um, uh, I, I started taking a lot of festival work on as well. So I... I, I worked for a while uh, for the first man to ever do proper coffee at Glastonbury. Um, like before anyone knew what a latte or a cappuccino was, <laughs> him and his brother, these two Kiwis, came over to Glastonbury in the 90s and went, I want to go at that. And everyone went, Christ, that's lovely. Uh, so I, I worked for him. It was a great way to see all the festivals. And then because, you know, I'm, I'm a big guy, I got approached by a few security people. I got some security opportunities at different festivals. I used to work a lot of beautiful days. I did nearly 10 years there. That's the, the Levelers Festival down here in mm-hmm. Devon. Um, uh, and uh, and then, you know, the more I did it, I started uh, running teams. And then for, yeah, a few years, I just kind of did a mix of construction and security. Uh, I did a construction job you might be familiar with, uh, the new Fourth Crossing. Um, All right. I was, yeah, I was on the steel team for that. Uh, that was the <laughs> last time I was in Scotland regularly. Uh, so I was I was on nights on that. That was a brutal job. Like I, I like I this bet is that was a little bit I, nippy in the winter. Sheesh. Uh, this is the reason I don't want a real job again. I've done a lot of real jobs. I'm not some work shy kind of guy. Like I I, I can work hard. I just don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to. <laughs> I was on nights. It was seven days a week. You could 
take the Saturday and Sunday off if you wanted. But it was um, time and a half on the Saturday and it was double time and a half on the Sunday. And we were on night rate anyway. It was one of the best paid jobs I ever had. Yeah. But you'd earn in a weekend what you earn in a week. So you didn't really mm. want to take the weekend off. And they would get very fussy if you started taking every Monday and Tuesday off but still work the weekend. Uh, you'd soon be out of there. And yeah, we'd be, we'd be up on the fourth crossing in 50 mile an hour winds. They shut the bridge down at 60 miles. So you can't work in certain conditions. But I had a foreman. He's a mate of mine. I don't want to knock him. But he would be out there with a wind reader while everyone was sat in the break room just holding it out. He'd come and go, Oh, it's holding off at about 54. I reckon if we just stick it out for another few hours, we might be able to get to work done. And everyone in the break room is going, we get paid the full night if you send us home now. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was a hectic gig. Um, I'm kind of glad that I never went back to that. And then, uh, yeah, uh, I, I went back to doing more security and I started taking it a bit more seriously. I, uh, I worked in uh, pr- probably one of the more high profile venues in Brixton for a while. Uh, and that was, uh, that was an interesting experience. If you know much about Brixton in London, um, it's, uh, it, it, it can be a bit rough. Um, I used to be all Bill and Peckham. So yeah, ah, I'm familiar right. with Brixton. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, I, 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 I spent quite a while working there and I ended up being uh, second to the head door. So I was usually the first person in with a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm very good at talking to people. I don't like fighting. I'm a big guy. I can look after myself if I want to, but I really, don't. I getting punched hurts. No one likes getting mm. punched. Yeah, so yeah. I would always like try and talk my way through things and be reasonable. And nine times out of 10, that does work. And that one time out of 10 that it doesn't, if that happens in the place that I was working, it was horrible. Mm. Um, we had some really, really rough nights there and it just got to the point where, I realized like I wasn't being paid enough to take the risks that I was taking. Uh, I I spoke about it in one of my videos for Remembrance Day. I started to get uh, adrenal fatigue, um, which is basically is your adrenaline gland just starts over pumping because it's going off so many times Mm -hmm. because you're in so many tense situations. So I was going home. I wasn't able to sleep. If I did sleep, I'd wake up like rolling around thinking I was in a fight. It was really quite stressful. And my head door at the time was a Royal Marine. And uh, I said to him about like all this stuff going on. And he said, oh, yeah, that's, that's adrenal fatigue. He said, soldiers get that. Uh, he said, it's precursor to PTSD. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not a soldier, buddy. Like, we're just doing a door in Brixton. And he went, I've been to Fallujah. It's similar. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a weird thing. Like, and I don't want to knock Brixton in case anyone from Brixton is watching. But I, people would say to me all the time, Oh, Brixton's so much safer than it used to be. So much safer than it used mm. to be. I was like, what the hell did it used to be like? Because <laughs> yeah. it's still carnage now. I used to get it. Uh, I worked Peckham sort of 2002. I started at Peckham. And then I worked there on the 99 response teams for a couple of years. From there, I moved to uh, the Riot Old Bill. So we still we still patrol right. m- predominantly South London, but occasionally you'd be sent like north of the river for different things. Um, but yeah, I pretty much worked the streets until I moved to diplomatic protection. And I remember... I remember like being a proper street copper and my mates who all worked in the city and it was like the cool thing to do to come to Brixton and, and, you know, drink and you get your weed there. And then it started moving towards Camberwell and Peckham started on the up as well. And my mates were telling me that they were going to like these pubs in Peckham. And I'm like, there was a fucking drive by there yesterday. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I'm used to running gun battles in the high street and people just don't, People don't it's comprehend crazy. that the this sort of world, stuff goes on there. Yeah, the fact that the world carries on around it, I found Absolutely. really bizarre. Like, I, because yeah. I, you know, I, I'm not going to mention any names or areas, but I, at the time, knew who all the top players were because we had mm. to work in some sort of cohesion with them to make yep. sure things didn't get too awful. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, you'd go and like, I'd go on my day off to a local bar, a drink, and then some of them would see me, and they'd come up and start talking to me about some awful thing that had happened in the club and asked me if I could handle things differently. And like, I would just turn around to them and be like, it, being from Cornwall did me so many favors. Cause yeah. I would turn around to them and go, lads, I'm from the West country. We don't have postcode boards here. If yeah. someone's out of gear, they give you the number for the other person who's got gear. It's not really an issue. Like, and all <laughs> I've asked for any of you. Right. Are you there? How's that? 
Oh, wow, we got you back. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I thought I'd just leave and come back in. I've still got full bars, so I don't know what's happening there. It, it might be my end. I'm not sure. My internet is really playing up at the moment. I do apologise if it's my end. That's Folks, okay. we had a bit of a technical issue there, but uh, I think we're back up and running. Sorry, right, yeah. So the last I heard was uh, you were telling people you do you, they do things differently in the West Country. If someone needs a bit of gear, they just give them yeah, the number yeah. for the next person. So, like, I'd say to them, like, you know, like we don't have, like, the, the, the combative nature of the drug trade mm. down here. Um, like... Uh, so, uh, which is what causes a lot of the problems in that area. Um, uh, and so I, I just say to them, it's like, all I ask of you is to be as subtle as possible to make my life easy. Like, I, I know my, my background is festivals, and I, 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 I'm aware of what your last job was, but I like to enjoy myself in ways mm -hmm. other than drinking occasionally. Of course. And, you know, uh, I don't want people to have a bad time. I would often apologise to people when I found their drugs, when I was searching for them. I would I'd find a bag and I'd go, I'm really sorry, buddy. I need to take that off you. I don't want to ruin your night. I want you to go in there and have fun. But yeah. I, I found this, so I have to keep a hold of it now. That's yeah. that's just the rules. You will find more yeah. in there, probably. I won't point you in the right direction, but you will probably find it. <laughs> so when, when we'd have these people come in, like, if they were subtle, and I kind of saw it, but it wasn't over the top, it's like you can kind of go, all right, they're not being a problem. They're not hassling people. They're not causing arguments between other people doing the same thing. But then you'd walk into a toilet and you'd have some guy standing there going, Cock, Mandy, Cock, Mandy. It's just like, what, yeah. what do you expect me to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Before I joined the old bill, I, when I lived in Glasgow, I was I was actually a doorman in Glasgow as well for geez, six years before I joined the old bill. And um, yeah, I know. I know full well what it's like. We had the same issues up there. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do think to myself, I don't think I would like to do that job now because like back in the day, yeah, we had drugs, but you know, it was nothing major. And we, I think I saw about two shooters in six years, a lot of knives, obviously up, up Glasgow way. But I've been Jen, lucky enough not to have to deal with guns, but I have yeah. dealt with knives and it's, yeah. It's not fun. It's, weirdly, when I have had knife incidents, I've I've been very calm during them. Like uh, I I I go to pieces if I'm given a form to fill in. Uh, <laughs> like, I, 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 I'm not good. I don't know if I've got ADHD. I'm on a waiting list for it. But if you give me like five pages of forms that I need to fill in, that is a nightmare for me. I am a nervous yeah. wreck. But the times I've had a pulled a knife for me, I've just been like, right, that's the problem. That's the thing we need to get rid of. All my yeah. focus is on that. And I, I found, I, I don't know if you've ever used this, I found just repetition and not losing track of the subject work. I would just always say to people, I can't have this conversation while that's in your hand. That needs to go away. That needs to go away. Whatever they said wouldn't engage. Was just like, that needs to not be out right now. That needs to be somewhere where I can't like, put it away, drop it, whatever. Then then I'll, then I'll engage you in everything else you're yelling. That needs, and I just constantly like that. And it worked, luckily. So far, <laughs> I, I found a very swift, hard jab to the face followed by a headbutt. That worked quite well. <laughs> That'll work as well. But it, when there's a knife in play, I like to be as far away from it as possible. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. If if you can, yeah, if you can. I, yeah. I used to work. My my old boss on the doors was uh, he was a lovely, lovely fella. He came from the RAF. He used to do close protection in the RAF. He ended up working for fun-loving criminals doing, you know, he was there, worked on their security team actually and did work with U2 and all sorts of people. He really went places after the clubs. But he was, he was just like, Roadhouse was like his Bible. You know, the film yeah. Roadhouse. And that's exactly <laughs> what he was say, like. My Bible as well. Be nice. Yes. It's be exactly nice. what he was like. Not to be nice. Hundred percent. That's the first thing he said to me when I joined, and he was like, "You know, yeah. you're a big lad." So he said, "You've got that, but be nice. Like, there's no reason for you to be an arsehole. Yeah. Just be nice." And he used to say that. I, be nice until it's I, time I, I, not to be nice. You get so much credit as well being nice when you're big, because the other option is you not being nice, and you don't mm. even need to say the other option is me not being nice. Like, I'm six foot three. I've got a silly haircut, beard, tattoo, all the rest of it. And usually, if I go up to someone and say hey buddy what's gone wrong here like just like just big smile no matter like i always used to say because i got to the point where i was like training people as well and i would always say to people it's like you set the emotional tone for the interaction mm -hmm. when you come in you have a short moment where you can reset everything and if you get their attention and you manage to do it in a good enough way you can actually stop like a physical confrontation mm -hmm. without sure. going physical. now sometimes like everyone knows that doesn't work every time Mm -hmm. but sometimes it can and 
Like uh, I, I used to use a, a weird little trick. Um, uh, so I was quite into Darren Brown, and mm-hmm. he had that story about getting mugged and saying my wall's not four foot high. Uh, like just said something complete non sequitur to the guy to distract him. So what I used to do with people uh, when there was like people squaring off and it wasn't quite physical yet, but you could see, you know, it's all puffy chest, gorilla arms, that sort of thing. Uh, I just go in the middle. I go, well, right, it's a bit much drama for a Thursday, isn't it? And I'd say that on a Saturday. <laughs> And the first thing that everyone does <laughs> is go, it's Saturday. And that just goes, and they, they just all pause for a second. And they look at you and go, it's Saturday. And, like, and just that little pause, that's enough of a distraction. Then you go, what's going on here, guys? And you just step in between them, you start talking. Hmm. And it's like, you just give them a little, like, it's like a mental stutter. Um, and it like, like I say, again, doesn't work every time, but it worked more times than it didn't. And uh, it, it got me through a lot of rough situations. Yeah, definitely. So, um, Bikes. How did bikes come into the equation? Uh, bikes. So I uh, I went to Thailand when I was uh, twenty. Let's see, it was lovely. When I was twenty five or twenty four, uh-huh. um, uh, I took a job there from uh, an artist who I used to live with. I used to do all the DIY in the house, and she rang me up and went, "Can you do a building conversion?" And because I was 24 or whatever and could use a drill, yeah. I went, yeah, sure I can. And she went, well, I'll pay for you to come out to Thailand and I'll give you a free place to stay if you renovate these buildings for me. I went, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I turned up and I did exactly that. And it, fortunately, this was in the days when smartphones just appeared. And YouTube, I, anything, how to build a house. <laughs> absolutely. Anything I didn't know how to do, we're just like, right, what am I doing here? Um but yeah, obviously, bikes massive part of Thai culture. Mm. Um, so, like, I needed to be able to get myself around. First thing I did, what you do is you go, you hire a scooter because back then it cost like one pound fifty a day to hire a scooter. Uh, I nearly crashed it on the way out. Um, it, was, it was great. You can go the first hire place I ever went into. I was like, oh, I'd, I'd like like a scooter, please. They go, okay, uh, you have driving license. I went, uh, no, I don't. They said, okay, you have passport. I said, yeah, yeah, right here. But okay, you leave that here. I was like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> okay, you have 3,000 baht, which back then was like 20 quid. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's like, give me that. <laughs> and then you just give them that. You never see that again. Um, <laughs> and off you go with a scooter. And I, I taught myself how to ride bikes in, in Thai traffic. Uh, I was very lucky that they have, uh, they use the same time as the road of us. So that's, uh, that was helpful. Um, but yeah, in Thailand, uh, you get good quick or you don't get the opportunity to get good. Um, because it's, yeah. uh, I don't know, have you been out there yourself? Yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I did a big trip. Um, well, I'm gonna get grief for mentioning it. I did a big trip around the world on the bike, and um, yeah, I saw that in Thailand. Like, they they have that sort of Buddhist mentality. Is it Buddhist? It's 100%. Yeah, it's that I mentality asked, yeah. of you know, if it's God's will, it's God's will. So they just go, like, <laughs> they just they just go for it. I asked one of my Thai mates about that. And again, I don't know if this is how all Thais think, but this is what this person said to me. Um, he said, uh, well, if, if you're a Buddhist, you th- like nothing bad is going to happen to you if you've mm. been a good person. So like, why wear a helmet? Why, why, mm. why not like check your phone while you're on your bike? Because you're doing good, uh, which sounds lovely. But the downside of that is uh, I knew a girl out there. Her dad was a mechanic and he lost an arm in a motorcycle accident. And uh, everyone outside of his direct family shunned him. And he wasn't invited to like social events and things like that because they'd assumed, because he'd hurt himself in this accident, he's a bad he must person. have done something bad. Mm. And therefore, he's being punished for it in some way. And therefore, they didn't want him around. Wow. So even like, and again, like I say, this is, I'm only speaking about that particular person. I don't know if it is the general attitude, but like that to me was like the the sort of side of that religion that you, that doesn't get spoken about so much. Mm. Um, it's very yeah, I, easy. So go on. Sorry, go on. No, no, please, after you. I, I, I think it's very easy. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a religious person myself, although I, like, I completely respect people's rights to believe whatever they want to. Um, uh, but, yeah, it's it, people sort of put religions in tiers of preference, and it's quite a common thing to hear, particularly if you go to a lot of festivals like I do. Oh, Buddhism's so lovely, Buddhism's this, mm. Buddhism's that. It's like, well, no, it's, it's got the same problems as all the other ones. Like, of if, you're, if you're committed to an ideal to such an extreme extent that it will make you uh, take um, illogical, possibly unethical actions based on your beliefs, um, then, yeah, like like every other religion, it's, it's got its downside. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I saw, I saw 
that sort of fatalistic attitude they have firsthand one time. I remember um, waiting at like a T-junction, waiting to come out onto... No, no, I'm talking out my bum. I was behind one of those big... Um, you know, the big sort of flatbed trucks they have with a skyscraper yeah. of, of like straw and stuff just yeah, roped yeah, on the top of it. That, yeah. And we were coming up, I could see a junction uh, over on the right and there was a moped at that junction with a young lad on it. And we're coming down the road and, you know, and we're, we're trundling along at sort of 45, 50 odd mile an hour. And this guy on the moped just pulled out straight in front of the truck. And I, I assumed that he was going to, you know, he was going to pull out and maybe either keep to the right or the left and let the truck go through because there was no way he was going to get be fast enough to get in front of this truck. But he didn't. He just pulled out straight in front of the truck and literally as I'm behind the truck, the truck sort of does that, slams on the anchors. I I went to the front to see if, if I could help. But, uh, you know, geez. the important yeah. part of the bloke was no longer connected to the rest of him. So it was like, geez, yeah. wow. Nothing you can I, do with that. I was lucky enough that I didn't see the immediate actions, but I saw mm. the result of some nasty accidents out there. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's weird. You're having a lovely day. You come around a corner and suddenly you see bits of people you're not supposed to see. And yeah, yeah it, uh, it's, crazy, it's not isn't fun. It? But it's weird that that is their attitude that, you know, well, that that's that's just, that's uh, Buddha's yeah. will or God's it, will or pardon my ignorance. But, I, yeah, I, had yeah, a, yeah. I had a crash out there, uh, which is one of my favorites. I, um, uh, so I'd, I'd gone out to buy some gravel for the place that I was working on, and I was I was up in Chiang Mai, and I was on this little dual carriageway. It's called Canal Lovely Road. It's a dual carriageway mm. with a canal in the middle of it, and there's all these little turny points uh, where you can cut through the middle. And I just wasn't paying attention, and I went past the place to buy the gravel, and I was like, "Oh dear, I've missed it." And then I saw a turning point coming up, and I was like, "Oh, it's all right. I'll just take that." And I put the brakes on, and I don't know if you're aware of this. They don't always maintain the vehicles very well. <laughs> Um, no way. All of a sudden, my back wheel locked up. I wasn't heavy on the brake really, it just fucking locked um, and slid out from underneath me. I low side along it. I used to ride in, uh, I had a, a, a sort of bubble helmet. Full leathers, um, obviously. Yeah. And a Korean army jacket. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, like, and I just slid down the road. Fortunately, wasn't too badly hurt. Um, I had a little scuffle, uh, jumped up. There wasn't too much traffic. I managed to grab the bike, pushed it into the little turning point, and I started checking it to see if it was all right. And I was checking it for about 10 seconds, and then I just heard, hey, Falang, Falang, which for those who don't know is what yeah. they call us there with foreigners, Falang. Um, and uh, it, there was, uh, I'd crashed right outside a police station, <laughs> and there were two policemen leaning on their bikes, smoking, and they were just looking at me, they were, Falang, Falang. And I was like, yeah, yeah. You okay? I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm like, okay, move. <laughs> like, that was it. <laughs> that was their entire investigation into what happened. <laughs> was like, but if you're all right, get out of here. When, when was that? You were in Chiang Mai? Uh, 2012. I was there for our New Year. So I think it was 2011 to 2012. Might have been oh, the year after the year before. I was there 2013. Oh, uh, Christ. <laughs> well, yeah, if I, I'll, I'll have to check like Facebook memories, but I might have been yeah. there at the same time, yeah. Did you it's, go? Uh, the... I love it there. I, I went back a while ago. I still speak quite a bit of the language, uh, which you know, oh, wow. if you speak the language over there, they because a lot of people go over there and don't bother. It's the same thing as being a big guy and being nice. Being a Westerner in Thailand and speaking Thai, they cannot do enough for you. I mm. went to my local market one day where I'd, I'd been going there for about two weeks, and I was like picking up more of the language. And there was like this matron who kind of ran all the stalls in the market, and I was buying something, and she would come and chat to me every now and then. And she said, Dad, are, you, are you living here now? And I was like, oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, sorry, wrong price, wrong price. And she took me around <laughs> to all the stores. I just told them to charge me Thai prices. <laughs> and everything went up. I went back there a few years ago with some friends. Um, I, I took a mate out there for his 40th. And uh, we would go around and I'd, I'd get them to like go and ask for things first. And they'd go and like try and barter a price for a taxi or order a drink at a bar at and then, like, I'd get them halfway through, and I'd walk up and start speaking in Thai, and the price would cut in half every yeah, single yeah. time. <laughs> but, awesome. Yeah, so to, as much as I went again on a bit of a tangent, that was where I first fell in love with bikes. And uh, then for years, I didn't ride. And at the start of the lockdown, uh, I, I'd been doing security at that point for the last three years in Brighton. Uh, I'd been doing a lot of different jobs in Brighton, but every winter I used to run the emergency homeless shelters for St. Mungo's. Um, mm -hmm. They have this thing called the SWEP initiative where if it, it's certain weather conditions below zero or yellow weather warnings, they have these satellite sites that open up 
they take in the legitimately street homeless and they say, look, you can stay here tonight. You get a hot meal, hot drinks and sleeping bag, whatever else you need. Uh, but obviously, because of the client base, you needed security on site. So I would stay in these rooms. Uh, well, they were usually like big halls. We'd have, sometimes have like 30 people in there um, and just see that that was all right overnight. And then when COVID hit, uh, I was getting ready to head back to Cornwall because no one, this was like the first week as lockdown was just starting and no one really knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, I've got a caravan on the Cornish cliffs. If, if the world, if the apocalypse does happen, if it gets Mad Max, I'm going out with a hatchet, stealing a car, and I'm driving back to Cornwall. I don't care yeah. what happens. Like, um, fortunately, it was a very boring apocalypse. Um, so instead, I ended up working. Uh, but at one stage, that was a phone. genuine concern. That At one stage, I remember thinking, yeah, yeah. you know, when the shelves started going a wee bit empty, and you're like, this yep. could get pretty crazy if this carries but, on. Well, like one of my housemates said to me, what's the worst case scenario? Like, what have you thought about? And I'm... You know, I wouldn't call myself a prepper, but I'm a little mm. bit of a doctor. There's a reason mm. that I live the way I live. Um, and I said, well, the worst case scenario is that this is really deadly. And then the people who run the infrastructure for the country aren't able to do their jobs. And even though most of it's automated, it does need human interaction. So if the power goes off and the mm. water goes off, then we're fucked. And then mm. we're going to need to know what to do. I said, I'm going to Cornwall. And if you are willing to do the things that I'm willing to do to get there, you can come with me. Now, I was packing this bag with this mindset, and I got a phone call from the contractor for the homeless uh, jobs, the guy who owned the security company. He said, literally, the first words out of his mouth were, you're not thinking about going anywhere, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I was like looking at my bag and all this stuff I'd loaded up. And I was like, funny you should say that. He went, uh, so like this was before anyone knew it. He said, uh, no one knows this yet, but we're going to put all the homeless people in hotels. Uh, you know the client base. Would you be interested in running the high-risk unit? Uh, and I was like, Okay, um, what's this going to be like? He went, look, you're going to be guaranteed to be earning money for all the lockdown. And we've already spoken to the council. You're going to get a special pass, which means you're able to go outside. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get in any trouble for anything. And I was like, I like being outside. Let's do that. Um, and, and yeah, so I spent my lockdown working with 30 of the most severe mental health cases, uh, crack and heroin addicts, uh, all, all sorts of people who perhaps should have been sectioned but were not sectioned. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, at the time, I had money coming in, didn't have anything to spend it on, and I needed a way to get around. And you could, but if you were an emergency worker, still do your CBT. And I was like, I've been wanting to get back into bikes for ages. Like, it's always been there since Thailand. I was like, I'll go do that. And I went and got my CBT, and I went and got, I got a Keyway Superlight, um, which, uh, which I snapped through two clutches on, because, you know, <laughs> I'm six foot three and 18 stone. Uh, I was probably actually a bit bigger then. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, I, I, but obviously all the testing centers got backed up So the homeless work finished. And I ended up moving to the film security, which is what I've been doing for the last three years previous to all of this stuff. Mm. Um, so for the first like year of doing that, I was commuting between Cornwall, Brighton, London, and further afield on a one, two, five with all my gear in a backpack or bungee corded to the bike. Um, uh, so the, the, the second one I got was a Sinus Hoodlum. Uh, again, like a keyway, but just built slightly better. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then I got a, a Mutt Akita, which I'll be honest, I absolutely loved. I mean, it's it's still a one two five. It's still small, but it's a really fun little bike, uh, yeah. and it was really comfortable, which was great because it would take me about ten hours to get from where I am now to Brighton because <laughs> um, uh, it's all A roads and B roads. You can't go yeah, the yeah. motorway. And then, yeah, and like I say, the, the, because the testing centres were backed up. Uh, I couldn't do it. So by the time I went to sit my test, I had over 10,000 miles of road use. <laughs> um, so, uh, and uh, my instructor is a great guy, actually. I'd like to give him a, a shout out. Is a uh, safe ride in Brighton. Um, uh, my instructor for that, he's uh, ex SBS, um, and he teaches the highest levels of motorcycle courses you can. He teaches police interceptors, ambulance, uh, blood bankers, all of that stuff um really really good guy and uh like on day two he's like you're probably gonna pass don't worry about it uh <laughs> and unfortunately the other guy on the course was also a guy in his 30s who didn't want to be silly didn't like was just serious about doing it he said it's great i haven't got two kids i've got two grown-ups like we're just gonna have a lot of fun for four days um and do that and yeah uh sat my mods passed everything uh two days later i bought that triumph tiger i've never regretted it since it's Beautiful. uh it's been Beautiful. the best thing I've ever done. 
I, I love the little bikes, the one two fives. I just I've I've done a, a fair few, quite a few of the cynicis actually, uh, and I I just love them. Like I, they I'll are honest, woefully the underpowered, Hoover, but they're great the fun. Was wonderful. If you if you put a four hundred engine on that bike, yeah, it'd be amazing. But even with me on it, it's like as long as I kept it in first or second on the Cornish roads, it could move me. <laughs> Yeah, I remember I did a series uh, called The Big Big Little Adventures. So there was me and, and two other sort of YouTube motor vloggers, Richie Vida and um, Mr. Fish. So Fish and I rode from London up to the Peak District, and we met up with Rich up there. He was on a little Honda Cub. Uh, Fish was on a Honda Cub, and I was on the Cinus 125. And then we just did a road trip all around the, the Peak District roads and some right. green lanes. And then we left Rich, and Fish and I went to Wales, and we went round Wales on the 125s and came back. We ended up doing, like, I don't know how far it was, 1,000 miles, 1,200-odd miles in, like, three yeah, days. I, it was great yeah, fun. I, I, you've probably seen from um, from some of my posts, like, I, I don't give a crap if you're on L-plates and on the tiniest little Honda you've got or if you're riding the new um, 1800 from BMW. I don't care. You've got a bike. You're taking the same risks as me, and you're probably having fun, and that's the main mm. thing. Like Absolutely. Uh, bikes Bikes are just such accessible fun. Like, I, I have a thing that I say to people, which is bikes are the most fun I've had without women or drugs. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it's been more because uh, the, the bike at least allowed to fix the problems with the bike. <laughs> well, like it's more that. expensive. <laughs> yeah, it's not as bad for your health. The bike. <laughs> not talking so about much, women. No. Talking about women. Uh, cool. Right. Okay. Uh, how about we crack all my questions? Because I'm conscious that we've got a fair few questions here to get through. And um, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. We've already been about 45 minutes, so... Yeah, I, I apologise. I do ramble. Mom, if I start rambling and the answers to questions, cut me in, you know, give me a wrap-up signal or something. You you are talking to the wrong person if you want somebody to, somebody to be succinct and not uh, ramble. Wicked. In that case, go for it. I've got nowhere else to go. Beautiful. Right. My kind of guest. Right. First off, we'll go across to the clan over on Patreon. So massive thanks to everybody over there. Patreon.com forward slash teapot one. First one, Charlie Callard. Cracking guest again, Bruce. His books on the bog are quality and his vids have, <laughs> have me laughing my bollocks off. So questions for Guy. What's your favourite part about living off grid? Also, if you could have any bike, what would it be? Well, there's lots um, for us to, to, to get into there, but let's just answer his questions first. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, I mean, my favourite part about living here is, like, it's just peaceful. I don't – I'm a very sociable person, but I don't really like being in a house even by myself or with other people. I, I don't know why. I've just never really been into it. I wake up every day. I open that caravan door, and I can see 20 miles up the coast that way, 40 miles down the coast that way. And I lean over my fence and I have a piss and it's the most glorious thing as the sun's coming up. And it's just, it's so peaceful. And you really realize that you, you don't need much. Like I went to a party last week um, where a load of people, I went to a school friend who works in finance now and all his mates work in finance. And I was like some weird circus attraction to them. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, was, I was talking to them about like what they do in their lives. And, a lot of them were embarrassed to tell me about their job, first of all, because they didn't feel it was interesting enough. They often didn't like it or enjoy it. Yeah. And they were using this job as a means to buy these really expensive houses in London with the idea of like having some sort of security in the future. And I'm like, well, I've got everything I need right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I mean, I, like, I, I, at some point, I'm, like, I would like to have a patch of land for myself, but that is something I can work towards. I don't feel that I need to get on the property ladder or anything like that. And it just, it's so, like I say, yeah, it's peaceful and it's minimalistic. And you, like, you, yeah, you, you appreciate the things you do have when you don't need or want much. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I, I get that. It's, it's incredibly liberating when you're content with what you have, I, yeah. I find. Like, I've, I've spent my life working for other people and then – in lockdown, literally a month before lockdown, I resigned from the old bill uh, predominantly because of stuff that happened on, on YouTube. Uh, but I, I resigned and then bang, there you go, you're self-employed. I had the view of starting up tour. Well, I did tours anyway, but to take that to the next level, basically. Uh, and obviously lockdown hit, so the whole tour inside of things, that's gone. So it was a nerve-wracking period for me, but I cannot imagine 
going back to that old way of life and working uh, for other people because I've got I, I have full control of what I do now and I, I just can't I, imagine I can't not loving it. When when the strikes were going on and I wasn't doing the film work because film work as as much as it was grueling hours it's the safest security job I've ever had. I, I put my hands on two people in three years of the film industry. Right. One was a lunatic homeless guy who just wanted to cause problems. And the other was actually a gaffer who started a fight with a locations manager <laughs> and was really quite surprised when I grabbed a hold of him and uh, explained uh, how he was supposed to behave. He started screaming, I'm an HOD, which is head of department. Like, and I was just like, well, it doesn't matter right now. As no. soon as you put your hands on someone, you become my problem. Yes. So you need to calm down. And yeah, but he, he very quickly learned to apologize and behave himself. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it, I can't, I, when, when the strikes were happening, I was like, I might have to go back to door work. And I do not want to go back to door work. I'm, I'm mm. 36 years old now. I've been really lucky. I don't have any nasty scars. I like, you know, I've, I've seen some pretty horrible things, but like I've got, I got through it okay. Mm -hmm. And I know people in their sixties who are still on the door, and I'm just like, mm -hmm. I don't want to be that guy. Like, yeah. fair play to you for doing it, but I don't want to be that guy. No, no, I, I, I get that. I get that completely. Um, okay, Charlie also says, if you could have any bike, what would it be? Um, honestly, my Tiger, but with everything fixed. <laughs> <laughs> like, what issues you got with the Tiger? Uh, well, so you said you wanted to keep this short, but um, <laughs> uh, I get uh, a couple of quick ones. Is um, uh, the a, a few uh, months ago, one of the bolts on the rear sprocket made a bid for freedom and has chewed through the rear uh, swing arm. Uh, so I need to replace the swing arm because right now it's got a bit of a gouge in it. Um, uh, I need to replace my rear wheel because the um, I didn't change the. Uh, bearing quick enough and it bored out a tiny little bit of the inside section so it's got a lovely squeak right now it's probably a little bit wonky um the heated grip on the throttle side has gone which is not a lot of fun at this time of year uh oh and the cable that goes to the rear wheel which uh is the sensor that controls the abs traction control and cruise control um and tracks the mileage um broke a while ago uh and broke. it cost 200 uh -huh. quid to replace <laughs> and yeah, I'm not going to say how long ago, but a while ago. Um, uh, uh, it cost 200 quid to replace. I bought the new cable. I didn't buy the 50 pence spacer to put into it. Put the new cable in, ran forward, and instantly minced the sensor on the end of it. Because no. <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> um, uh, so, so yeah, it, quite simply, um, I, I love that bike. I would like to try more bikes to see what I think of them. But uh, like I, I have such a great attachment to that bike that simply just having it be looked after by a load of Triumph mechanics and made as good as new would make me happy. Mm. There you go, Triumph, Triumph UK. Come on, come on, guys, well, a perfect I, I, I vehicle for you. I did have a with Triumph for the MCN, and I didn't ask for that. But um, uh, yeah, I might be doing a little bit of work with them in the future. Um, there but, you go. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I, I, I like I can't say anything. Not because I've been asked not to say anything, but because nothing's been confirmed. But yeah, I am yeah. hoping to spend a bit more time with them. Nice, decent. Uh, question for you both: If you could only keep one, which would it be? KFC, Burger King, McDonald's, or Subway? I'll let you go first on that one. Do you know I used to be a Burger King fan, but now I am a McDonald's fan. So it'll be Mickey D's. Don't yeah, have them um, often, but I do like them. Be my one of choice. Yeah, I, I I don't really eat any food like that. Uh, I will occasionally do it if I'm on my way home from a festival and I stop in a service station yeah. and it's yeah. whatever's there. In terms of taste, KFC is my favourite, but it nowadays, because I eat it so rarely, if I eat a load of KFC, I get super dehydrated. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. It's just all that grease about. But yeah, no, I, I, I try and avoid food like that. But if I was to keep one, it would probably be KFC. I'm the same. The only time I'll eat that is is literally if I'm on a, a big motorbike journey and same as you, services, right, bang, just give me something quick, easy, dirty, have it. Yeah. But it really doesn't agree calories. with me. It really does yeah. not agree with me. Crack, well, what, you know. what I do now is I buy those, whichever of the brands it is, because there's several of them now, um, you know, you get like those liquid meals with all the vitamins and whatever. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I would just, gra particularly if I'm in a rush, I just grab one of them, neck that, and then you've got enough calories to get you through the next however many hours you're on the bike. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of known for endurance rides, so I'll do like the thousand mile in 24 hours or around the UK and 
you know, as quick as you can, two days or whatever. And I, on, on those rides, I'll, I'll try not to eat any big meals. So I, I'll pretty yeah, much survive you know, yeah, on like, protein yeah. bar and one of those, one of those drinks really. Yeah. As you said, you, you don't, you don't want to be loading yourself up with big, heavy food and carbs and all this sort of stuff. So yeah, Absolutely. that's what I do. All right. Okay. Uh, shiny side up as always, gents. Cheers, Charlie. Thanks, pal. Next one, David McCracken. Guy, you're a legend. Congratulations on your success Stop on it. social media <laughs> and also for riding the best bike in the world, the Triumph Tiger 800. Don't let Bruce tell you otherwise. <laughs> uh, do you have a favourite book on the bog? Oh, yeah, the book on the bog. Tell people. What is all? What is the book on the bog? <laughs> so books on the bog are like, no one watches them except for the people who really love them. And they uh, love them, like yeah. successful videos. Uh, but the people, if I don't do one for a week, I start getting DMs from people going, <laughs> when the book coming back? And like, I put them up and they get, you know, a couple of hundred likes, which is like, not to be sniffed at at all. But compared to my other videos, they're really not that successful. But uh, so what I do is I read a couple of paragraphs from a book that I like while I'm playing classical music. <laughs> while sitting on my outhouse, um, <laughs> I, I have I have a long drop toilet, um, and uh, yeah, it's, I I do it because it's silly and stupid, and I really enjoy filming them. It's a really fun thing to do to just take a passage from a book, and I try and read very dramatically. Um, uh, my, my favourite book that I've read is a book that a lot of people watching is probably familiar with, which is Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of my absolute favourite books, but my favorite books on the bog that I've done was from uh, Brian Blessed's memoirs, uh, oh, Absolute wow. Pandemonium, wow. Uh, because I got to do a Brian Blessed impression <laughs> for the whole thing. <laughs> so, I was going to say, can you read the book like that and not do it in, in Brian Blessed well, it, form? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's about him finding out uh, that the passage I read was him finding out he's going to play Voltan in Flash Gordon. And I think it is in Block Capitals in the books. It's, Jesus Christ, Michael! Of course I want the part! It's just, <laughs> Gordon's that alive! Probably ruined, that probably ruined your sound. <laughs> no, but, I love it. But yeah, love it. It, it was so much fun to do. It got so many like really positive responses. So even though it actually, like if I want to market myself to sponsors and things, they ask to see like your recent... Um, whatever it is on Instagram interactions and stuff. This is all still new to me, so I, I find it difficult to keep track. But if they want to see that, it's actually doing me a disservice doing it. But I love doing it. It's so much fun. And, and people, some people seem to really enjoy it. But so you're I, actually, I'll, I'll say this. If anyone watching this really enjoys Books on the Bog, what would really help me is if you just go to my page, find a Books on the Bog episode that you like, and share it to your stories because mm. that will pop it up in the algorithm again. And if you want books on the bog to continue, that's the thing to do. Is that is like I appreciate I do this for a living, but I'm still very green with social media and how to make things and, really pop. But is that the current thing? Is it to get people to share it on their social their stories? I, I I think it's a combination of like sharing comments, how quickly the likes come in, how quickly mm. the comments come in. Um, but I have noticed that my videos that do the best are the ones that are shared. Because not only do they get shared to other people's audiences, but I think it does keep it up in the algorithm. So my my most successful video has very little to do with motorbikes, other than the fact that I say my somewhat accidental catchphrase of "ride safe and stay hydrated." Yeah. Um, uh, that, and that's where um, I did a stitch with this fitness guy who's jogging along, talking about how he doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, See doesn't it. do drugs. Yeah. And then, yeah, and I, I come running in with the phone on my hand, just going, I drink, I smoke, I get screwed up, I ride motorbikes, I go to festivals. Like, yeah. And that has now been seen by 8.4 million people. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just, I don't know why, but that just hit with people. And yeah. people kept saying, I, I think what it is, and it's what I try and do a lot of times when, I like make stuff with other people's content or I'm interacting with other people is I, I don't do anything aggressive online. I have, I make fun of people, but in a nice lighthearted way, I don't do it in a horrible way. Like mm -hmm. I invited the guy out to come with me and drop a load of acid and go to a gig because I thought like, maybe that's what you'd like to do. Like, just give it a try. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, like I, I think, social media it could be instagram is actually pretty good for it but there's a lot of toxicity out there oh, and yeah. i've i've had enough like negative interactions in the real world like when people leave negative comments on my posts i just respond with smiley faces and thanks mm. for dropping by because 
why would I want to get involved in an argument online? And it's it's why I don't like like I even when I like I sort of call out people for behaviour. I do it in such a silly way that it would be a bit ridiculous for people to get really upset about it. Mm. That might change, guy. That might change. Um, I, I was a bit like that, but you know, I've been. I'll swing the old lamp here. I've been doing the, the social since sort of 2000, 2010, 2011. I started it on the build up to the, to the trip. Um, I've really been been at it since about two thousand and sixteen, sort of as a regular weekly thing on YouTube. But yeah, I was like that to begin with. You know, sticks and stones, and you just you can okay. ignore the bad comments. But I, I think I remember the comment. I remember the comment that really changed it for me, and and it was a really personal one by someone that doesn't know me. I don't know them, but uh, I I did my trip because I promised my mum before she uh, died from cancer that I would live my dream yeah. and uh, you know pass my bike test and ride around the world. It's something I'd always wanted to do and I'd never done it. So she's the one that said to me, you know, look after those that you love, but live your life. That's where my tagline "Live Your Life" comes from. So I I had a video, thank you. I had a video that went viral on on Facebook back in the day and it got like four and a half million views in the space of 24 hours it was ridiculous and it was like a two or three minute montage clip of my world trip and it hit reddit and uh at the time i was using reddit because reddit was a real it still is isn't it but reddit at the time was like the way to try and get things to go viral reddit is also a very toxic one i don't do anything on reddit. yeah i don't i don't touch it anymore because some guy said something on the uh, he said something on the long along the lines of i'm glad your mom's dead so she hasn't seen what what a cunt you've become and i and i like it really hit me in that it stirred anger in me that I've suppressed for a long time, and I became like, uh, you know, in Taken. What's what's the what's the actor yeah, called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I sure you do have a well, I I was working in a fairly specialised part of of the old bill at that point, and I was like, I'll fucking find who you are. I'm coming, you know. Like my mates have got some big guns. Oh, someone's at my door, mate. Apologies, I'll be two seconds. I'm home no, alone at the moment. You're fine. Crack on. Two ticks. Um, Demo, if you're watching or listening to this, the package has arrived. He'll know all about that. Uh, <laughs> I'll yeah, see go you back to some of the things I'm into. <laughs> <laughs> Say no more. There's a reason I'm no longer in the old bill. Um, yeah, but I, I remember that. That really, that really lit a fire in a bad way with me. And um, yeah, you know, and, and like I, I still do it to this day. Like I read the comments. Everyone says don't read the comments, but. I kind of take the view that if someone's taking the time to engage with me in the comments, then the least I can do is try and give some form of a reply, even if that's like a like and a thumbs up or something. Yeah. But you read by doing that, you read the shitty ones, don't you? And I just, that's, I just kind of think that's what I want to deal with because, like you say, it's such a personal thing. Mm. Um, and you know, I'm, uh, you, you're definitely not wrong to feel the way you felt about it. Uh, but, but my my thing is, it's like I I tend to think with people like that they want to have that power of giving you oh, that reaction and that's what they're getting off on so that's why i don't give it because like i like i you know I, i've got screwed up teeth i get a few comments about that it's like i've had these teeth my entire life could not give less of a fuck what <laughs> someone in swansea had to say about my teeth like yeah. like because i'm never going to meet you and and like you know i also think about the ratios it's like I, I imagine that most of the comments that you get are incredibly positive. Yeah, absolutely uh, overwhelming. Most, most of the comments I get are incredibly. So if one person says something shitty on one of my posts, like, and I've got a hundred people saying something really nice, I'm like, I am not going to let you ruin my day. I've got mm. people in my like real life who try and ruin my day, and yeah. I'm quite good at not letting them ruin my day. So, <laughs> like, it's as, as much as like your your emotional reaction to that was perfectly valid. I'm just like. You're a stranger on the internet. You know nothing about yeah. me, really. Um, and you know, I like. I'm really happy with all the positive interactions I get. I get loads of really nice DMs. I always try and respond to the things that I get. I'm really happy interacting with strangers. But if you come in on a negative level, it's like, well, I don't need you. <laughs> like, it's okay. Yeah. And yeah, often, no, I often, like, I will rarely. I, I won't really. Uh, I've, I've Blocked one guy because he was just constantly, constantly putting negative stuff on the same post over and over again and to everyone else on the post. 
And I said, like, I'm, I'm a big, big free speech guy. I, like, I don't care what, yeah, like, what your opinion is. I think you should be able to voice your opinion because if your opinion is abhorrent, I know where you are and I know what you think. 100% agree with you there. Yeah, 100% agree. But, like, this one guy was just like, he was just harassing people. And I, 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 messaged, like, I sent him like, on the um, text thread. I was like, hey, buddy, I, I don't want to take your right of uh, speech away, but if you can't interact with people, I said, you're welcome to make your points, but you're just coming here and insulting people. So yeah. You either have like you can either like have this discussion nicely, or you can not have it. And he just responded with "block me." I was like, "Cool, <laughs> done." done. <laughs> yeah, your wish is my command. <laughs> like that wasn't a big deal for me. I said to you, "It's just like look, if you want to have a conversation, we can have a conversation." But yeah, some people yeah. are like that. The the reason I I sort of bite back at comments now, it's not. I try not to make it an emotional thing now, as in like I don't. I try not to let it get to me. But I I more take the line of. How dare you think you can speak to anybody like that? Do you know what I mean? When they leave a thing, it's like, nah, I'm not some 11 year old shrinking violet that's just going to sit there and let yeah. you say that. It's like, nah, if you've got something constructive, if you have constructive criticism or constructive co uh, comment, 100% say what you like. But people that just have a cheap dig, I'm like, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to tolerate that. So I'll, I'll have a little thing back to them. And then block them. You know, it's just like, just like, put yeah. it out there. No, no this I, isn't tolerated. I, I totally get that, and you know, but may, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll change in the future. But I, I, at the moment, it's like, it just, I, I can't let it bother me. And you know, it's like, you know, you, you're a big guy. who's done a few things. I'm a big guy. who's done a few things. It's like, I just, I, I don't want to let, I don't want to let like negativity uh, come in like that. It's so much easier to just like ha have the positive side. And and you also. I, I think it it works in your favour to come off as more positive. And quite often, mm. leaving those comments up there um, when they're really negative is other people will also come in and go, "What the hell are you talking about?" And like, yeah. Yeah. Them as well. And and you know, w without um, uh, w without wanting to make it sound like it's too much gaming the system, when you have that going on, again, that just it's engagement. It's great engagement. Um, yeah. And it's like, well, if, by by coming here and leaving a shitty comment, you're actually helping me. That's exactly what I say. I pin them. I pin the comment. And and as you mm. said, people it lets people see what fucktards are actually out there oh, and what you're dealing with. And most well, of the time, of the people really come to your defence. The uh, A lot of the um, uh, female riders who get sleazy men come onto their comments mm. and say inappropriate stuff. That's always my favourite thing when one of them will go, pin that comment, yeah. <laughs> and then just everyone else will come yeah. in and go, you're a fucking idiot, mate. <laughs> I, I love it because, obviously, I mean... I mean, my Instagram feed is is full of hot CrossFit girls and uh, all that sort of stuff, basically. Yeah. You know, because the second the second you'd spend a nanosecond longer looking at something, the algorithm yeah. knows you're into that, and it just chucks stuff at you. Motorbikes and girls with muscles. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and what I like is a lot of them are doing exactly what you said, but they they'll screenshot their DMs and post it up in the stories, and it's just yeah. like. I mean, obviously, I realise that blokes are sending stuff like this, but you just think, what a fucking idiot. Do you think you're just going to be anonymous here? Do you know what I mean? I, it's yeah, like, I, how, what thinks you're going to get away with this? I don't get the mentality. That I, it's, it's actually one thing I do is I keep all my DMs clean as hell. Like, mm. So I occasionally do get a slightly saucy DM and get propositioned. And, <laughs> and that's quite, it's, it, it's always like a, a nice thing when that happens. Yeah, me uh, too. Missing uh, flyer, stop sending me those messages. Well, Sorry. funnily <laughs> enough, I, I, I do get a lot of um, bears and rainbows getting in touch with me. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, when when girls get in touch, uh, I'll say oh, that's very nice. If I'm ever in your area and you want to go for a drink, that's great. And then if they start sending more smutty stuff, <laughs> I just respond to them with, "Look, that is lovely. I really appreciate that, but I don't want to ever send a DM to someone that I wouldn't want my mother to see." So uh, if I'm in your area, I'll give you a shout, but like, this isn't the interaction I'm going to have with you online. <laughs> and like, and it, cause I've just seen it happen to so many people. Uh, there's, there's so many people who, like on social media that have been caught out doing shit like that. And it's like, I, I, I never want that to happen to me. I've got plenty of stuff like in my life to be embarrassed about. I don't need it publicized. Well, that leads us nicely on to David's next question. Without incriminating yourself, what's the craziest <laughs> thing you've ever gotten up to? Um, I mean, it's, I don't think it's incriminating myself to to talk about drug use. Um, uh, Man, I, I, uh, I literally think there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. 
Yeah, no, I'm very, I'm very anti. Like, I basically, I, I don't really have much to say politically. I have two really strong stances. I'm very pro free speech and I'm very anti prohibition. Um, I mean, it's kind of hard to pick one because people have different scales. I, I think, like, mm. um, like, so I, I got a job renovating a 400, 300 year old vineyard um, in Slovenia from a distant family member while we were at a funeral. Um, and I moved to Slovenia with no money in my pocket and I spent three and a half months living up a mountain um, in, in pretty awful conditions. Uh, some people think might think that's crazy. Um, dropping. Oh, you, you know what? In terms of like crazy in like, I didn't think the result was going to happen was something I mentioned possibly before we got rolling. Um, so uh, November of 2022, I had been doing location security for the current season of uh, Rings of Power. Um, uh, I was the head of location security for their British run. And I had a massive fallout with the head of Amazon security, um, who, who I won't name, but he's a bellend. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but he provided me with a fantastic opportunity. So we had a little bit of a fallout. I, I had to leave the job. And I came home and I, I had a couple of grand in my bank account. And I saw online that one of my favorite comedians was doing a gig in New York and I had time and I had money. So I was like, fuck it. I'm going to go over there. And I, uh, I, I just, I, I was, I was literally, I was on a ferry between Plymouth and Tor Point. And it's a five minute ferry ride. I'd gone and done some shopping. I parked the bike, saw the gig was available. I booked the tickets before I booked the flight. It was about, I think, nine days away. I got home, I booked the flight, I did all my paperwork to go to America, uh, and then, yeah, flew out to America a few days later. So uh, the network is Compound Media. It's run by a guy called Anthony Cumia, who is one of the main inspirations for Joe Rogan. He's a close friend of Joe Rogan. Um, and the initial gig was cancelled, and I went to the bar that they have mentioned on the show a few times, and I met Anthony, the, the head of the network. And I, I just went up to him. I was like, hey, man, flew over from England. Love what you do. Um, be great to have a quick drink with you. He said, yeah, get a couple of shots. Sit down. Let's chat. He's a multimillionaire, an incredibly famous broadcaster. Wow. Just sat down and shot the shit for like uh, 20 minutes. And then I was like, right, I'm going to leave you be. Enjoy the rest of your night. Have a great time. The next night, we go to the gig. And uh, so they're, they're a free speech network. They're, they're comedians who've lost jobs because... Uh, They've said something they shouldn't. Just take culture. the wrong way. They've lost like yeah. TV gigs and things like that. So the reason the gig got shut down the night before is because protesters from Antifa had turned up and made threats against the venue. Now, mm. I don't think any of these comedians were actually saying anything that awful. I t uh, but because they had to relocate, they went to a place where they knew they weren't going to have these problems, which was the America First Warehouse on Long Island. And I, I walked in there and it is wall to wall Trump flags and American flags. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, this is interesting. And I turned up, I opened my mouth and they looked at me and went, where are you from? I was like, oh, I'm from England. <laughs> and there's like 200 people at this gig. There's only 200 tickets sold. They went, and why are you here? I was like, well, for, for the gig. For the gig. Went, for the gig. You here for this? And I was like, yeah. And they went, all right, hold on there for a minute. And they disappeared for a bit. It came back. And they went, all right, yeah, in you come. And then the owner of the venue came up, just was talking to me for a while. And like, I, I know when someone's trying to feel me out mm -hmm. and he was trying to work out what my deal was. And I was like, and he was just asking me this. I was like, I'm a big fan of Gino Bisconti, who's the comedian I was there to see. I was like, I've been hoping to see him for years. This was an opportunity. He was like, oh, okay. I found out in the back room that one of the people who was there, uh, so Gino's there and the other person was, uh, one of the other people, was a guy called Gavin McGuinness. Do you know who he uh -huh. is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Gavin, founder of Vice and accidental starter of a group known as the Proud Boys, was also <laughs> at this event. And they said, there's, there's a six foot three English guy with a tattoo on the side of his head and a mohawk. He says he's here to see Gino. And apparently Gavin turned around and went, he's an assassin. He's here to get one of us. <laughs> And I sat near the front of the stage and I found out later that I had the guards watching me and because of where we were, armed guards, yeah. just keeping an eye on me to make sure I wasn't out of order. So, no so sudden movements. Obviously, like, um, because by this point I've been spoken about, <laughs> one of the acts comes on and she just goes, uh, she's a girl called Chrissy Mayer, very funny. 
Uh, she says, who's the person who's traveled the furthest to be here tonight? <laughs> and like, I just like looked at me and I put my hand up. She said, where are you from? I was like, England. She said, and you flew here just for this? I went, yeah. And then the whole room stood up and applauded me. Hey. And I was like, oh, okay. And I'd met a load of them beforehand. And it wasn't, even though it was in a Trump warehouse, it, they weren't all super right wing. They were people who liked comedy. They were people mm. who were there to see the comedians they loved. It was just the nature of the event made it happen in that place. There were a lot of really cool people there. Um, and, and so like that happened. Everyone kind of relaxed about this giant Englishman who turned up. Uh, Gino came on, uh, interacted with me a bit. He said, I've got a chicken that looks like you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then after the show, we got chatting. Um, and he said, I'll oh, come into the studio on Monday. And by the way, sorry if this story gets too long because there's, there's a minute. No bit. dramas. Um, uh, so, so we get chatting. He said, I'll oh, come in uh, to the studio on Monday because uh, he does this web show. He said, watch us live. Just sit on the sofa. Come hang out. I was like, oh, that'd be wicked, man. Thank you. He's like, yeah, yeah. And then... I end up getting talking to Gavin McGuinness and he turns around and he was like, you're really from England? I was like, yeah. And he was like, that's fucking ridiculous. He said, you're here for this. He said, you know about all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, I'm a fan of the network. I said, I'm not super political, but I, I, I like funny people and I think people should be given a chance to be funny. And I like that that's what's happening here. And he said, when do you go back to England? I said, oh, Tuesday. He said, do you want to go for a pint on Sunday? And I was like, <laughs> when am I ever going to get a chance to go yeah, for exactly. a pint with Gavin McGuinness again? Because yeah. so, I, I don't agree with a lot of his political stuff, but I think he is a very funny and intelligent guy. And I said, yeah, sure. And uh, he made, so on the Sunday, he made me meet him outside a police station just in case this was all part of my plan to assassinate him. <laughs> he picked me up in his Jag. He drove me to his local bar and we sat there and drunk for a few hours. Yeah. And as I say, like, we didn't change each other's opinions on anything, um, but we had a really fun time. It was a good laugh. And then he was like, right, I've got to go see my family. And I was like, all right, cool. I'll catch you later, buddy. Next day I go out and I meet the guys in the, uh, in the bar for, um, uh, before the show that Gino was doing. And we start drinking. They say, oh, come up to the studio. We've got a bottle of Jameson's. We'll start drinking that beforehand. So during the show that's on beforehand. Now, I, I mainly drink beer. I drink a few spirits, but I don't drink a lot of neat spirits, like heavily. And they're just passing around red plastic cups of Jameson's that are like <laughs> half full. And because of this giant guy, they keep on passing me more and more. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to look like a weakling here. Yeah? I carry on drinking <laughs> with everyone. And then G Gino turns up and he sees me. He goes, yes, oh, brilliant, you're here. He said, oh, just before the show starts, he gives me his credit card. And he goes, can you go get us another bottle of Jameson's? I was like, yeah, sure thing, buddy, no worries. So I run off. I go get the bottle of Jameson's. I come back up to the studio. And as I step into the studio, one of the guys working for them, a guy called Big A, just goes, you're today's co-host. Good luck. <laughs> Bear wow. in mind, I've drunk about half a bottle of Jameson's by this point, and we had been to the bar. And I walk in, and I have having, and I sit down in the chair, like opposite one of my favorite comedians on the planet on his show that I watch four times a week. And I'm suddenly the person chatting to, him. and I was just like, I've just got to make sure this goes off okay. And I had a great time. Like really? I just sat there, like I, I know all the like the show lingo and things, and knew all the in jokes. I was just having like fun with them, and like every time I made him laugh, I was just sat there thinking, "It's like I'm making one of my favourite people on the planet laugh." This yeah, is yeah, this yeah. is brilliant. Yeah. Um, and we we went out for a for a drink afterwards, and I mentioned to him that I used to do stand up comedy, and he just turned around and he goes, "The fact that you didn't tell me that you have done stand up before you came on the show or try and do any of your act while you're on the show is a fucking integrity move." Like mm -hmm. I really respect that. He said, "If you ever come back and you want to do shows, come join up with us." So wow. absolutely pleasure to meet you. Stay in touch, and we have stayed in touch. I was on his show just the other night. Yeah, um, I saw that. Like, as soon as, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, like uh, if you want to go to the network, it's it, like I can only show so much on Instagram because <laughs> they are pretty raw. Um, but yeah, like uh, so it, that was a long answer. But like in terms of like the craziest thing I did, I went to shorten it. I took a, I took the last of my money after losing my job to go and watch a comedian that I liked, and I ended up. You know, I don't know, like, I don't know if I can use the term friend just yet, but like, we, we know each other, and that's mm. really nice. Absolutely. I, it was interesting what you said there about um, with G Gavin McG uh, McGuinness, how he's not somebody that you would usually engage with. You know, it's, you, you don't, you don't I, have I engage with anyone, regardless of their beliefs. Yeah. Like, that I, was the wrong I, I terminology. Like 
But you, yeah, you're of, so, you're on d- different political paths and ways of thinking and things. But uh, that is why I like this. This that's why I like podcasts. Podcasts the the long form conversation that you can have on here. It's not like a three minute, four minute, five minute yeah. soundbite. What's going to get the clicks? Fuck all that. It's a conversation between people where you it's can talk own. about what you think, and you know I'll listen to what you say, and then I I've got a chance to reply and give my side of things. And you realise when you have conversations with people from all sorts of different backgrounds and political persuasions and religious beliefs. You, it's the same when you travel. You you realise we're all just the same. You know, you might you might wear a people. different colour. Exactly. 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 I've I've got friends who by some would probably be considered quite far right. Mm-hmm. I don't agree with a lot of their political stuff. I've got friends that I would definitely consider far left, and I don't agree with a lot of their political stuff. I've got friends who works with, with Extinction Rebellion and mm-hmm. as I say, I know people associated with the Proud Boys. I like people and when it comes to political discussions, if you're not the person actually making that policy and that decision, have whatever opinion you want. Mm-hmm. And if I think your opinion is shit, I'll tell you and we can discuss it just like yeah. people. But if I like hanging out with you as a person, you can have a political opinion that I don't agree with. And I, I really think, like, not, not to get too much on my soapbox, but I really think we're being told that we're much more divided than we are. When you go outside, like, uh, people actually just get on with each other. Like yeah, a thousand percent, like, a thousand most percent. Most people yeah. aren't obsessed with race and gender and sexuality and things like that. There's all these loud minorities on both sides that are like really like that's their thing, that's the only thing. And what you see on TV now is they go right here. We've got a blue-haired extremist who only mm-hmm. eats kale and glues her face to the road, and here we have a Nazi. Uh, right, you two talk for three minutes, mm-hmm. and, and and it's like that's what you're told that the discourse yeah. is, and that's not the discourse. No, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Um, and I think I think more and more and more people are realizing this. I think through things like podcasts, you know, mm. where you have that chat. For me, I love I love Rogan. I love uh, Bill Burr. Uh, all, all the big shows. I'll sit and I'll listen. Like Theo yeah. Vaughn and people like that. I'll sit and I'll listen. Some days they've got the gar like Theo Vaughn. He might have a garbage collector on on one time, but then he's just had uh, he'll have Tucker Carlson on or yeah. or JFK I, Jr. Yeah. on, and you have like, two or three hours to listen example. to. Them. Like I I don't agree with a lot of his uh, more yeah. religious rhetoric, but I think he is a fantastic journalist. Yes, like, absolutely. I, I, I really a true journalist. Like, a true I, 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 journalist. I be, being a biker, you've probably seen the speech he did at Sonny Barge's funeral. I, I've not. No, no, no. Oh, I, you, I watched his Putin great. interview, actually, but um, I haven't so, seen that. I've, I've only seen a few clips of the Putin interview so far, yeah. but he turned up at Sonny Barge's funeral. It's hard going. And he, and he did a speech there. And he said, I've noticed I'm the only man in a suit here. Um, <laughs> and everyone starts laughing. And he talks about the, the idea of freedom that comes with American culture. And, like, I, I'm fascinated by America. I think it has got an awful lot of problems. Like, anywhere does yeah yeah. but the principled idea of freedom of expression and personal freedom uh what's it life liberty and the pursuit of happiness Mm -hmm. like i love that it's like that's what i like as well specifically in the wording the pursuit of happiness you don't have a right to be happy you're not guaranteed to be happy but we're going to try and set up the framework of the country so that you have enough freedom to find what you think is going to bring you the most happiness and so yeah like like most things, like the idea of America is great to me. It's it's somewhere I want to spend a lot more time. Yeah, I'm I'm very lucky enough. I'm I'm out there next week. I'm I'm out from mon- I'm out for about ten days, I think. Just literally, it was one of those you know, fuck it, let's book it moments. Yeah. I, I had a a friend on the podcast, a Welsh chap called uh, Alad, who did exactly that. Booked some tickets, went over to uh, the States just because, you know, he's a young lad that lived in Wales and he was kind of bored in life and just fancied, you know, seeing a bit more of the world. So he booked some tickets over to America, which led to, you know, uh, he ended up getting work over there because he's pretty handy on a bike. So he ended up um, getting a few jobs. He ended up meeting the love of his life. So he's now married an American chick and he, he lives up in Indiana. And on the podcast, he was just like, you know, we got chatting about Sturgis and Daytona and all this sort of stuff. And exactly what I we've just said, the American mentality of, you know, the world's your oyster. Just yeah. just go for it. Go but, for but it. You and, need, yeah, you need to be the one to take the proactive steps. It's not yeah. given to you on a plate, but the gate's open. Like, yeah. 
So he said to me, he said, right, so when are you coming over then? And and he literally kept on, and even after the podcast, was messaging me going, right, have you booked your tickets? Have you booked your tickets? So I just went, fuck it, okay. You know, I'd, I'd just done my, my, my tax thing at the start of the year there, and for... <laughs> For once, the tax man didn't pull my trousers down and do me dry. <laughs> so I ended up with a little bit of spare cash left. And I was just like, well, fuck it, let's let's just do it. So I just booked, I booked my flights and uh, I, I think yeah, I booked two nights in a hotel. Like taking those that moments again, yeah. Yeah, so I'm I'm just I'm just winging it really. So I'm just going to go over and play up in the Appalachian Mountains and I've got ten days oh, up there. On he's giving really me a bike, fun. so I can't wait. I'm very can't jealous. You, you're going to have a fantastic I, time. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. And then I'll use you know I'll use social media just to say right I'm going to be I'm going to be this place tomorrow or the next day. Who wants to meet up? And that's kind well, of what I did fun, on the world trip. It's funny it's enough, brilliant. that was the original plan with this was I was going to go back to the film work and earn enough money so that I could take six months off work and go to America. Yeah. And then maybe use like the interactions I was getting off of this to have like a bit of an easier time over there and meet some mm-hmm. locals and things. And like I am, I am f- like it's, it feels weird to say I'm I'm flooded with invites from mm-hmm. people in the states. Like, yeah. Um. Uh. A, like I've got almost as many followers in the states as I have in the UK at the moment. Wow. Um, and uh, it's like it's really nice to see. And I just yeah I. Uh, I, I hope to be able to take pretty much everyone up on that offer because, you know, people are like, hey, I live in Texas. I live next to a gun range. Come, we'll go for a local ride. I'll take you out. We'll shoot some stuff and have a good time. <laughs> uh, some guy in Alabama who was just like, hey, you want to go hunting with me and do a barbecue? I was like, fuck yeah, man, let's do that. Yeah, yeah. It's life, isn't it? It's living life. You grab those opportunities and you, you make of them what you will. Yeah, 100%. Right, cheers to that one, David. Next question, Stu L. Hi to you both. I've been following Guy since he first started on Instagram. Things seem to be going well. Books from the bog are a personal favourite. A couple <laughs> of questions, if I may. How's the GoFund page going? Right, so what's the GoFund thing all about? So the GoFund, when I made the decision to not go back to work, and I, at that point, was, uh, I was... Five, beha- five payments behind on my bike because uh, mm-hmm. I don't own that outright. Um, mm-hmm. uh, instead of buying the one I could afford, I bought the one that I fell in love with. Um, That's so, exactly what I do. Yep. yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've been out of work for a long time and I'd just been, I'd been putting everything into this and it was going well. And I just went, well, if I want to carry on doing this and I want to build it bigger, like I have stuff, I've, I've, I've spoken to you about this. I've got ideas mm-hmm. for YouTube that I want to do um like uh, like long form interviews um like but like an actual personal one so meeting people in person seeing their life um and mainly being bike focused but it's also about meeting the biker as a person uh, yeah. regardless of how but yeah i was like i need funding for that um and i need to be able to catch up on the money worries because i can i can work on the farm here and earn enough money to keep myself alive but i couldn't keep up with those payments and yeah, like, like, like most people, I do find it hard to ask for help. Um, mm. but I was like, look, uh, at that point I had nearly 40,000 people following me and I just thought, well, if it, it feels like people are liking this and people had sent me a, like a couple of people have sent me some really nice donations on PayPal. Cause I had a PayPal link up just kind of saying, Hey, if you like what I'm doing, mm-hmm. I'm point, I was like, maybe I should just be honest about my financial situation. So I made a post, I just did one of my talk to camera pieces and explained what my situation was and explained what I wanted to do with the channel uh, if I had the opportunities. Um, and as I said earlier, in, in a couple of weeks, um, I, I asked for £5,000 total. And in a couple of weeks, I had 2000 in there. And that got the people who were going to come and take my bike away off my back. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I've also had, like, after that, some don- more donations have come in. And that's just helped me sustain myself and keep myself going. It's what got me to the MCN uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, because if, if I hadn't had those donations, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I wouldn't have been able to fix my bike. I needed new tires. I had a tire that was looked like a car tire. Um, it was <laughs> completely um, flattened off. It had the profile of a brick. Um, and yeah, like I, all my maintenance had fallen behind. It hadn't been serviced for thousands of miles. Uh, and like, I can do a fair bit myself, but I was like, I need someone to take a look at this and tell me if I'm being an idiot. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, currently I think I'm that at just over 4,000 pounds. Wow. Um, it's been amazing. Uh, I can't believe that this many people have faith in what I'm doing and want to see me continue doing it. 
Um, it, there's, if people are interested, there is a link on my Instagram bio. Uh, you can go there, uh, it just says donate. Um, and that will, you can read the full story there about sort of what the past six months have been like. And yeah, uh, everything I have at the moment and every bit of money I get coming in, it goes right back into this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, outside of feeding myself and paying my rent, everything is going into this because this is now my full-time gig. And as I'm sure you know, with the people who approach you, like it's very hard to like get actual money. I've got some great affiliates, uh, if you don't mind me saying, uh, Moto Covers, the sheepskin seat guy. Um, he's fantastic. Uh, he's the first person who wanted to work with me when I had like two and a half thousand followers. Um, I, 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 I've got an affiliate deal with them. So when I sell them that I get a little bit of money trickling in, but most of the time people just want to send you a product and be seen with your product. Yeah. Um, and it's like, well, I, because this is my main gig, I, I, I need to earn money from it. And I don't want mm -hmm. to ask people who are following me directly for money. I want to have it set up in a way where it's sustainable through, things like sponsorships or when they're moving to long form stuff on YouTube, when you start getting paid per view. Cause as I say, my, my overheads are tiny. Mm -hmm. I don't need a lot to keep myself going. Um, uh, so yeah, sorry, again, uh, long answer, but the GoFundMe has gone way better than expected. There's still a little way off the goal. If people feel like putting some money towards it and they like what I'm doing, I'd be extremely grateful. And, uh, yeah, I am trying to set it up. So that for the people who have donated, uh, particularly kindly, I'm keeping track of so that when I have uh, more merch available, um, that they will be able to get some items. And I want to be able to give discounts uh, on other events that I'm doing, like tours, but obviously that's a separate company. Maybe mm. I can just eat some of those costs. But yeah, like I don't want people to just blindly give cash. I definitely don't want people to give money they can't afford. I want them to feel that they're getting something out of it. But if just watching me read books on the toilets is enough um, to feel like you're getting something out of it, then then fucking bless you. I'm, I'm really, really, really happy. And as I say, well, just, just so grateful. All those links, folk, the GoFundMe, uh, all the affiliate links, they'll all be down below. So make sure you, you check them Thank out. Thank you very much. I know exactly where you're coming from there, Guy. Um, when I when when my YouTube was, was growing, uh, yeah. You, you know, everyone seems to think that if if you're on YouTube and you you've got a reasonable amount of subscribers, they automatically think that you know you're going to be raking it in, and yeah. that's just just not my not experience. You know, like I think my best paycheck from YouTube was about fifteen hundred quid, and it was a total freak month where uh, the 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 sort of payment per thousand views, the CPM, was really high for some reason. I think it was in the build up to Christmas or something, and I think I'd done. I happened to do a vid that just, or a, a succession of like three or four vids that did really well. So the views were up there. I think I had like half a million views uh, on the right. channel, um, you know, for that month, which for me is a lot. For other channels is nothing, but for yeah, me no, but it was was good. This is why I'm saying, like, if it's if it's sustainable for me, I said right at the start, like, if I've got food in my cupboard and petrol in my bike, I'm a pretty happy guy, mm. and anything on top of that's just amazing. Yeah. Um, and but but like I say, the money on top of that goes to things like being able to travel to map out tours, uh, to meet people, to make more content. Uh, I'm going up to Hinkley um, or this Saturday to go and see the guys from the Machine Shop, who I found out because of you, um, mm -hmm. uh, and and do some work with them. Um, uh, so yeah, like any money that I get, as I say, just it goes right into this uh, yeah. once once I pass my living costs. You and you really the, sorry, go on. I was just going to say, like, uh, one thing I keep on saying to people, because, like, I've had a, a few slightly ne negative um, uh, people say, oh, you know, well, you're never going to get rich doing this. It's like, I don't, I'm not trying to get rich. Hmm. Like, uh, there's a great uh, musical artist called Beans on Toast that I love. And, uh, and there's a line in one of his songs, which is, I'm here to make a living, not a killing. Mm -hmm. And nothing could be more appropriate for what I'm trying to do. It's like, I just want to sustain myself doing something I enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I find that, you know, unless you're getting big views, and by big views, I'm I'm talking over half a million a month you need to be getting on your channel. Um, uh, the way I make a living from doing this is 
Yeah, YouTube brings in a couple hundred quid uh, a month. Then I have Patreon. Patreon is by far my significant, most significant income stream. Um, I do merch. I do talks. You know, I'll give presentations at events and stuff. And I've got my tours. Um, you, you basically just have to have as many income. St- I've got all my affiliates, which I don't really publicize too much. But, you know, you, you basically need to have as many different income streams as possible and not that's, rely that's exactly on any one. Mm, yeah. Uh, so speaking as you as you, as you mentioned doing talks, uh, I would like to quickly mention. Um, I, I think you're you're familiar with the the lightweight adventure festival. Yeah, yeah, um, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. So they've invited me to come. Um, uh, I'm, uh, run a couple of events there. I've got a couple of ideas for talks, but uh, I'll also be running. Uh, I won't go to the format right now because you know I don't want to take too much of your time. But um, uh, I'm running an, an audience participation show there, which <laughs> I think is going to be a lot of fun really funny uh it's for people who you know uh it's, it's for riders to tell stories about riding basically but uh, i'll announce more about that when it comes but yeah lightweight adventure festival and the adventure bike show um uh, that uh, i'm going along to them uh so it's been really nice getting rung up to be booked for things like that there is a a very very small chance that i will be going to the shirt that you're wearing uh the ABR. ABR. um I, I have had some invites uh, with that. And yeah, like you say, just little things coming along. For me, like, there's no one thing that's making it. I haven't started a Patreon yet, which I, I probably should. But, um, I, oh, I do have one in here. Um, if people do want, I do have one of my fancy stickers. Um, yeah, there's, yeah. again, LinkedIn bio to go and purchase them. <laughs> and yeah, uh, all of it just goes to supporting the channel. Yeah, I, I um, had that sort of, what's the word? That interpersonal debate uh, about you know doing Patreon and and all the you kind of feel like I felt like I was selling my soul to begin with you know I was like well why why it's hard, would, isn't it it's, yeah why it's would hard anyone to say pay to money. yeah why would anyone pay to get stuff that they can get for free anyway but what has become apparent to me is that if you if you strike a chord with somebody, you know, and you, you will attract you, you, you plainly have, you've already done it. You attract your own clan, your own community to you. And yeah. in amongst that will be a real core of, of people who love what you're doing, uh, whatever that is, and they'll I, want to support you. And for I'm me, very, I, I'm very much like you, you know, I don't want people just to give money. I, I, I feel like I need to give something back on top of what, anyone can get just by watching my vids so you know i've i've got a really good strong community over what we're going through the questions now over in my clan on on patreon and we go away for weekends we do meetups uh, i'll do the odd live stream you know you just try and do stuff to give back to people and and you sound you know, much like me like it's it's hard to accept that people want to give just for the videos alone like yeah it doesn't sit well like, with me that yeah yeah and like it's like it's really nice. It's lovely. But yeah, you, you, you sort of get this weird guilt complex about it. That's why I'm so happy to be doing the tours. Mm-hmm. Um, like that's just gone live today. In fact, while you were talking just then, I got a little message saying seven of the tickets have been sold already. Hey, uh, so yeah, that's really nice to see. Because uh, there's only 10. I think if we sell a lot, I might try and add some extra spaces. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, starting, I'm starting small with that. I want to build it bigger. But yeah, being able to have experiences because interactions are what I find the most fascinating. Like, so because I've worked in festivals for so long and I'm re- like, I'm, I'm distinctive, you know, like I'm a <laughs> big guy and I'm easy to spot in a crowd. Um, I know people uh, across the festival circuit across the UK. Most of the time, if I go to a party or an event, there's a good chance I'll bump into someone that I've met before. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's a bit of me that's kind of used to people coming up to me and going, oh, hey, I know you because like I've been so active on the festival circuit. But when I went to the MCN the other week and bearing in mind, like I've done security for some quite high profile people and I'm used to managing fan interactions between people. sort of going like check that the person's OK with being approached, check that this person's OK and not a complete freak and <laughs> like try and arrange it so they can meet and also be the person to cut it off. And you see like the nervous energy that people get when they're meeting someone. And now I've got people approaching me with that energy. And like, it's like, it's really humbling. And I, like the first thing I try and do is try and make people comfortable because like, I, I I've seen what it's like from the other side. Um, and like when I went up to London, like I, I pulled into the bike shed, which is just an amazing place. 
And I was meeting someone there already who contacted me online. And I got off the bike and started talking to him in the garage. And like within 30 seconds, someone came up to me. They were like, oh, hey, man, like, I watch your videos. I was like, oh, cool. Well, uh, we got chatting for a bit. I went and sat down. And this, I sat down at the table over. The guy went, oh, hey, man, I watch your videos. And I was like, oh, cool. Uh, I went to the toilet at one point. And I came back and he spoke to the guy I was with. And asked him to ask me if it was okay to get a picture. And I was like, Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Sit down with us, mate. <laughs> Sit down. Like, come over here. What's your name? What do you ride? So, what I do, whenever, like, and it, it was very, very strange to do that. Um, but, like, I do, what I tend to do is I ask people questions about them yeah. um, uh, because it tends to make them more comfortable. I, I had a, a, a really funny interaction at uh, the embassy, and it happened a few times. Uh, so, I, I take it you know uh, Harvey rides bikes. He's the guy who rides around oh, London you... handing out Harry Bow. No. Well, no. You don't know, but he's a great channel. He's got like, I think he's just hit uh, three, and a, three and a half hundred thousand on uh, Instagram. Uh, I would definitely recommend watching him. He's, he's wonderful. And he's a really nice guy. Uh, but he, um, he so far has kept his helmet on because it's all GoPro footage. Yeah, you don't yeah. see him a lot of the time. Um, and so, so he's, particularly in London, his account is very famous, but no one knows what he looks like. And yep. on the first day of the MCN, he was following me around with a camera, catching interactions with people. And uh, like people would come up and talk to me, like, oh, hey, blah, blah, blah. and I'd say, oh, oh, this is my friend Harvey, and point to what they saw as a guy with a camera. And he'd say hello, and he's got quite a distinctive voice. Yep. And they'd hear his voice and go, hold on, are you... <laughs> you can't be like, oh, yeah. And then they completely lose interest in me. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Go, Why are you following him around filming him? But, but yeah, he's he's a great guy. He's been really helpful uh, to me, N not only in just like the fact that he's like uh, like made an effort to spend time with me and stuff like that, but he's very like switched on on the business end of things and I am not at all. I haven't got mm. a clue what I'm doing. And uh, he's been unbelievably uh, helpful um, so yeah, if uh, if you haven't seen him, check him out. Uh, anyone watching this who hasn't I, seen him, Harvey rides bikes. One of my absolute favourite I, accounts. I think I maybe do follow him. Actually, I'll need to have a look. Uh, you, Harvey, you, my you apologies if if I do, and I'm saying I have. He's had a Harvey couple of really good viral videos. One of the most recent ones is a car pulling out in front of him and then stopping and not doing anything, and he opens the rear passenger door and rides oh, off. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen yeah, that. Yeah. I've seen it's that. A, yeah, yeah. It, it, which I think is great because it's not aggressive. It's not rascal stuff. The guy is driving like an idiot. He just goes, "I'm just going to do something minorly annoying and <laughs> just ride right off." Yeah, and I thought that was a really good interaction. <laughs> Right, we better crack on my questions because this yeah, is sorry. like an hour and a half now, I think. Uh, Tom R, uh, sorry, Stu, thank you very much. You had some other questions there, Stu, but I think we've answered them anyway in the course of the, the yeah. conversation so far. I apologise for my ramblings. <laughs> no, mate, no, no, it's what this is all about. Tom Ireland, great guest to have on and looking forward to the chat. Guy, how do you stay hydrated? If you could only <laughs> read one book on the bog, what would it be? Cheers, Tom. Well, I think we've covered the second one, but how do you stay hydrated? We have, well, uh, right now I'm staying hydrated with the drink of Cornwall, <laughs> proper job. Because um, uh, uh, there's, it's, I call it taste of home. It's my favourite. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I hate to be boring. Uh, and there is already one well-spoken Englishman uh, on the internet who talks about this a lot, but I am powered by Yorkshire tea. Um, <laughs> I have... Uh, <laughs> I have a, uh, I, I drink a lot of water and I drink a lot of cups of tea and that's what keeps me going. And the, the, in case people are wondering, the way that came about is... Uh, that's just the way to ask. Ride, yeah. Well, I'm a biker and I ride bikes. I'm also a raver. Like, I love going out and have a problem. One of the things that you'll hear on the dance floor all the time is when you finish the conversation, like, stay hydrated, buddy. Like, just you want to have a lot of water in a situation like that. Um, and when you're riding on a bike, it's ride safe. And it all started, it was my first video. I was at a festival and I made a joke video speaking in the poshest voice I could muster, giving a tutorial on how to crush a can and stick it under the kickstand of your bike if you're in a muddy field, <laughs> yeah. which everyone knows how to do anyway. I just wanted to be silly with it. And I just finished it by saying, ride safe and stay hydrated. <laughs> and then I just started saying that at the end of my video. <laughs> and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's picked up and people seem to really like it. Um, uh, so yeah, that's why it's on my stickers. It'll be on my merch. Um, yeah, it's, it's an accidental catchphrase. I mean, it made me smile that about being on the dance floor, obviously. People are slightly chemically enhanced, aren't they? I remember exactly. back in the day, uh, you know, late 90s, early noughties, when I first came to London, I had some mates from uni that had all come down here and were doing jobs in the city. And we, we were, you know, I, I used to go 
out clubbing. I was right into the clubbing. I used to love trance, you know, pop up full on trance music. But I I had never touched anything at that point. It was just purely booze. I saw, I, I liked a beer. I didn't touch anything else. And all my mates were into pills and everything else going, you know. Yeah. So they'd be out on the dance floor off their nut with a bottle of water. And I'd be there with like bottles of beer and just giving it loudly. And everyone, I would watch throughout the course of the night and people would just disappear to the chill out rooms and they'd all be sat there with water. And I'd be like the only one left on the dance floor with like three bottles of hooch. <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny, man. Like, uh, like you have different uh, experiences. Like I've I, I mentioned before, like my, my, my favourite, uh, like, and it's, People have got like an impression about me because of that uh, that viral one with uh, where I'm running. Oh, like yeah. I'm not a complete wreckhead. I don't do this stuff all the time. <laughs> it's like a once or twice a month thing. Um, <laughs> but when the summer comes and it's festival season, my birthday is usually the start of it. It's the 18th of May, and we have like a start of summer party. Um, yeah, like uh, I love a, a, a nice cocktail of a, a, a healthy magical fruit pastel with a, a nice bit of liquid acid <laughs> on it. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, like, I, I think you have some great experiences. And if you learn to manage, uh, when I was working with the homeless, one of the support workers, uh, came to complain to me one day because she'd heard me talking to one of the other security about the weekend I'd had and the drugs that I'd done. And she said, don't you think it's a bit hypocritical that you're working in this environment and that you're so freely, uh, talking about your drug life? And I was like, well, number one, I'm not talking to the clients about it. I'm mm -hmm. talking to another colleague who is also my friend. I said, number two. I turned up to work today at six o'clock in the morning. Like mm. I have, I, I, I manage this around what I do. Like this isn't my priority thing. Yeah. I, and there have definitely been stages in my life where I haven't had the balance right, but I do feel that I have got a good balance now. Like I can hold down a job and go and enjoy myself. And mm -hmm. if I find a point where I'm not enjoying a substance, like weed, for example, I haven't smoked weed for over a decade. It stopped agreeing with me. I stopped having fun with it. I dropped it. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. left it alone and like don't object to anyone else who uh, does that but yeah like you, you have to you have to be able to manage these things yourself there are some people who should not smoke weed there are some people who should not drink alcohol there are a lot of people who should not take cocaine like mm. it's just yeah, yeah. yeah it it is what it is um uh so yeah like i i don't want to ever be seen as like advocating those activities to people but i also have zero problem with them it's just like you have to have the personal responsibility to manage it yeah, absolutely. I, I um I, I remember in in the old my early days in the old bell, I was vehemently anti drugs, basically because I saw I saw the bad side of it. But of that's that wasn't because they took drugs. You know, like now I know it's because that's the sort of personality they had where they yes. weren't able to turn up at work at six o'clock in the morning. You know, like it became the drugs became them. It wasn't a case of they were using it recreational, recreationally and could manage the, well, I was going to say consequences, but they, they plainly had addictive personalities because yeah. at one stage I was like that with booze. You know, there was a, there was a point in my sort of life where I kind of had to take a little step back and go, you're probably drinking a little bit too much here. You know, it's like every night you're going out, every night you're not just having a few beers, you're getting on it all the time. Like, and, and at that I point, I just sort of took a little year. step back. Sorry, say again. I say I, I do two months sober every year for exactly that mm. reason, just to level yeah. out. Yeah. Just, just, to, just to have a, a moment where you step back and you make sure that these things aren't controlling you. Yeah, it was it was motorbikes actually for me. Um, up until I passed my my uh, DAS and and got a motorbike. Up until that, every single day off, I'd be going out on the piss every single yeah. day off. So if I worked five, six, seven days a week or whatever, and then I'd end up with two or three days off, um, the way the shifts work. Well, at least two of them, I'd be on the piss. And uh, and then you suddenly soon had I, another outlet that was fun yeah. and enjoyable and didn't as make you wake as, up feeling like shit. <laughs> that's exactly it. And as soon as I had the bike, it was just like, you know what, I, I, I don't really feel like feeling like dog turd. I'm, I'm going to go out and do something. And it just stopped. You know, like there was no there was no big thing about it. It was just like, I'll just drive. You know, I'll, sorry, yeah. I'll just ride. And um, that was it, really. And now I have, I have a couple of beers during the podcast, but that's about it. Really? Yeah, I, mean, I can't well, think of anything I mean, worse I, than going out to the pub anymore. Anyway. <laughs> my third beer, and this is probably the most I've uh, drunk in, um, I'd say, probably this month. <laughs> 
Unfortunately, when you look big, it's a really expensive habit. It takes me ages to get a habit. <laughs> I used to be like that. Literally, I could have a crate of beer and then go to the pub by back in the day. But now, like, I can have two beers and be perfectly happy. <laughs> Right, cheers, Tom. Thanks for your question. Next one, Michael Cotton. General niceties and all that jibber jabber. Now that you both have achieved fame and fortune, yeah. Oh yeah, where's that then? And are probably yeah, more popular than our current and potential government, what would your first three policies be if you were voted in? Only allowing one biker related answer each. All the best stuff, Mike. Okay, right. So we have control. We Ooh. are the government. What's your first three I, policies? I try and not be political. I'm going to get myself in trouble here. Um, <laughs> no, you are not on this podcast. Not at all. So, um, I mean, my, my first thing is I think that our speech laws need to be updated for full free speech protection. Um, outside of obvious things like, uh, you know, you have libel and slander and public endangerment, like the examples always yelling fire in a crowded theatre, that sort of thing. Um in terms of opinion, I don't think you should ever get in trouble for expressing an opinion legally. Um, yeah. Whether that is an anti-royalist statement, and uh, even though I, I will completely qualify for this by saying I don't agree with uh, this, but there was a, uh, a guy who was arrested in Scotland, I think, uh, recently for uh, shouting um, anti-Palestinian sent sentiments uh, in public. Um, and I'm just like, that guy's probably a dick, mm. but... I don't think you should be arrested for saying something. Um, yeah. I, it doesn't sit right with me. And the reason I feel so strongly about that is because if you give that power to a government where they can say, this is the thing we don't want you to say, it sets a precedent. So if then someone comes into power who says, well, this is also a thing we don't want to say, and it's a thing that you want to say, mm -hmm. then they already have that power. So as Which much is exactly as I, what's happening. It's exactly yeah. what's happening. As much as I disagree with things that are being said, as I mentioned earlier, I want to know where the people I disagree with are. I want to know yeah. where the abhorrent people are. I, I think that uh, a pride parade should be able to march through the most conservative neighbourhood in the Midlands as it can. And I think that the EDL should be able to march, you know, in, in the middle of Brighton. They probably won't have a good time if they do. But like, like as much as I disagree with everything they stand for, you should have the right to express that opinion. Uh, because yep. the way that people change their opinions is by having discourse, by mm -hmm. having a conversation. One-to-one -one conversation, you, you change the world one person at a time with a conversation usually. Um, there's, uh, I forget the guy's name, a uh, jazz musician, Daryl something. He collects uh, clan outfits. Yeah, I saw, yeah, yeah, yeah amazing. Yeah. Fascinating dude. And like that to me is a prime example. He's he's a black guy who goes and hangs out with clan members and mm -hmm. just talks to them until they go, ah, maybe I've got the wrong idea about this. And yeah. it's like, that's what we should be doing. Like it's incredible, want, isn't it? Yeah, I want people to be able to say terrible things so you can go, dude, that's a that's a terrible thing. And when they ask why, you explain it to them. And if they've got a modicum of common sense, they might just be able to turn around and go, Oh yeah, I might be wrong about this. Mm -hmm. um, and give them the chance to admit they're wrong about it because if you suppress it legally and you know I'm not saying we live in some awful fascist totalitarian state or anything we've, we've got a lot better than a lot of the world but yeah uh, free, free speech protection would be one um, as I said I'm very anti-prohibition it would probably take a long time to explain exactly how I would do this but uh, correct legislation and management of substances so that people had sovereignty over their own mental state they can choose to enjoy substances other than just alcohol, caffeine and nicotine, which are heavily taxed and regulated anyway here. Um, it would save so many lives and it would take so much money off the black market. I mentioned Brixton earlier. Um, if you took control of the party drug trade and legislated it and managed it properly, you would take so much money away from the uh, black market and you would keep so many people safe. There would be so much less violence because the vast majority of the violence that I've seen uh, in my life has been due to the drug trade. Um, and uh, and uh, third one's tricky. Um, he said he said bike related. Um, yeah, you can have one uh, bike related. You know what? I'm not going to go for bike related. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, I've been saying this for years and it's nice to have a platform to say it. I think even though I don't like a lot of licensing and over legislation, I think what you should have is like a pub license. Don't we legalize all this stuff and make, make things acceptable, all these different substances. 
you have to get your pub license. When you're 16 to 18 or whatever, you go and work in a bar, and in that bar, people who haven't got their pub license can come and drink. You're going to get the worst customers. And you get your pub license by working in one of those bars for six months. So you see how bad a bad customer can be. And mm -hmm. then when you've got your pub license, you know what it feels like to be on the receiving end of a bad customer when a you're out service. in a bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you go to a bar with your pub license, everyone in that bar has worked six months on the worst possible bar that they can. And they <laughs> know how to behave. They won't snap their fingers. They won't wave their money across the bar. They will be good customers. They'll all get on with each other. They won't start fighting. We won't be perfect. There'll still be a few dickheads that get through. But <laughs> I think, yeah, like have, have a pub license. You have a training pub. We do it with driving. You need a license to own a gun. You need a license to own a dangerous animal. Like why not just have it so that like you, you can be trusted to go out and be an adult in control of your own mental state but you need to prove that you know what you're doing and you need to see what it's like being on the receiving end, working with a sober person who's serving you. <laughs> There'd be a lot less yeah. fights and takeaways as well. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think I make you right there. I make you right. Um, yeah, I, I totally go with the first two. Absolutely, 100%. I'm, I'm all for freedom of speech. I think I think you should be allowed to say exactly what you want to say. Um, I, I personally think we don't need any more legislation because there's enough law and legislation out there. So if you're, you know, if, if you're spouting forth some horrific rhetoric, you know, saying that you want to go and kill these people or those people because they're that colour or they're following this faith or whatever, there's enough legislation. Simple Public Order Act. You know, if you're causing yeah. harassment, alarm, or distress, well, the old bill can deal with you. So why do you need all this other stuff? And like you said, I think it's. It's good to know where somebody stands. You know what? What? What do they think? I, I, I think when you when you inhibit free speech, you force it under the table, and that's where you're exactly. going to get extremism. That's, that's, that's when extremism dangerous. is going to yeah. is going to flourish when it becomes 100%. like if people down have to into go the ground because of their beliefs. That's when yeah. dangerous stuff starts happening. Absolutely, totally, totally. Um, for me, what I think is government being a politician should never be a full time job. I think you should have you should have a maximum, like in the States, a maximum of two terms, whether that's as a prime minister or just as an MP. You should never, like never allow, be allowed to so finish in your... Yeah. yeah, you should. I used to see it all the time when I worked in diplomatic. It, you'd see these snivelly-nosed little fucking 17, 18-year-olds, fresh out of school, no life experience, and they become like the dog's body for some MP in Parliament. And yeah. they just, that's the life that they know. Literally, that's it. They've never worked another job in their life, and they end up becoming an MP. Bang, that's it. I, I think that's wrong. You, you should have to be, to be an MP, you should have to be a success in whatever your field is. And I think so I, I things like the Chancellor, of the, like this Chancellor of the Exchequer. Sorry, mate. No, sorry, you I, carry on. You're in the middle of something. Like the Chancellor of the Exchequer, how can the Chancellor of the, the Exchequer have no financial background whatsoever? That to me sounds insane. How can you be the head of education one term and then at a click of a finger, oh, yeah, now you're in charge of fisheries yeah. or you're in charge of farming or you're, you're, you're in charge of chancellor? It's insane. That's just, there's yeah. no logic to it. So I think so, uh, if you're going to become an now, MP at, at, and in a specific role, you need to be the you need to come from the best and we need to pay for the best fine pay for the best but you're only going to get two terms out of it and then you're back to normal life i think that's a great idea and uh yeah, yeah so, sorry i meant to, i was saying it I, I didn't mean to interrupt you but uh, a friend of mine has a, a great no uh, idea about this um uh it's, so uh it's uh, the terminology used is liquid democracy um, and unfortunately, to get it through, you'd have to get the current system out of power. But the yeah. idea of how uh, his version of liquid democracy would work is uh, everyone votes on everything. We've got the technology to do it now with apps and all of that. But like, uh, so my friend Ralph is a fisherman, right? Or he was a fisherman. He stopped being a fisherman now. Um, if there's a vote on the fishing industry, I have, everyone's got the power of one vote. But I give my vote to Ralph on anything to do with fishing. I use the app to do it. I go, Ralph's in charge of fishing. Now, say 50 people in the town go, Ralph knows what he's talking about with fishing. We've got that. Ralph now has a power of 50 with his vote mm. on fishing. Mm -hmm. Ralph can turn around and say, well, my skipper knows more than me. I'm going to give my vote to my skipper. And if everyone on the crew does that, then maybe that skipper's got a voting power of 300. So whenever a fishing thing comes through and he makes that vote, he's got 300 points worth of power. 
and you can do this with like every single policy, every single industry. You have the whole country on board of it. If they want to sign up to it, you can abstain, but you can be actively involved or as unactively involved as you like. And you can keep all of your votes and vote on every single issue, or you can pass all your votes on to everyone else. Um, the, the only problem with it is like the idea of people buying votes, but let's face it, politics are corrupt anyway. That's happening in some way, form or another. And it yeah. gives you like more control. So yeah, like I, I have no idea how you would get the current power base out because we have such an archaic political system in this country. My uh, Danish friend of mine, when I was living over there, uh, said to me, uh, said, uh, in England, is, is it your government that uh, you are on two sides of the room and they are all shouting at each other? And I was like, yeah, there isn't. Isn't that what government? He said, no, no, let me show you. And he turned on the Danish equivalent of prime minister's questions. They're in a circular room and they're all speaking to each other. Nice, like mm-hmm. human beings. And we have this over the top fanciful, like these rules of speaking and engagement that they have. And it's, oh, it's awful. I can't watch prime minister's questions. I become an enraged lunatic whenever, like, there's not a lot that upsets me. I'm a very easygoing mm. guy. You sit me down for 10 minutes of Prime Minister's questions. I'm going, how the fuck is this how our country is run? It's disgusting. It's despicable when it needs to change. Guy, in my old role, I used to spend a significant part of my time around the Houses of Parliament, and I would be stood, you know, uh, in places where MPs feel safe. You know, they are in their own territory, they're locked away from the public, they're surrounded by their own people, and they say exactly what they think. And I was privy to that. I would hear it. And I lost all faith, all faith in British politics because it is a game. That's all it is. These people, obviously, there are going to be some exceptions, but they're few and far between from what I've seen, and I used to see the main players all the time. There's no integrity there. They will swear blind by yellow in one conversation then the next day turn around and go no it's red it's red yeah. you know what i mean and it is a game they laugh you see them having these hotly debated competitions on the tv and pmqs where they're at each other's throats like they're the biggest enemies going and then the next minute you see them in the pub and they're laughing about it La- taking the yeah. piss and, and you're just like it's it's just wrong. It's just a game if, for them. If I would put my tinfoil hat on for a second, there is a part of me that believes that the way that things are set up is actually to generate far more political apathy. So, for example, I yes. I haven't voted ever because I've never mm. seen someone that I want to vote for. Mm. Um, and I don't think that I should be in a position where I have to pick the best of a bad bunch. I'd rather pick someone that I like yeah. um, and someone that I feel is going to do the best for the country. And particularly in the last, however many years it's been now, probably the last decade, where we've had a political ruling group that have been hit with scandal after scandal after scandal. It seems to me as though, and like I say, it's a bit tinfoil hat, but I think they basically just have a backlog of these scandals. And what they do is they put a scandal out to distract from the previous scandal. And just when everyone's getting a bit fussy about that scandal and they're losing interest, but they want something to happen about it, you put the fresh scandal out mm-hmm. because nothing ever nothing ever gets done. No one ever actually gets in trouble. No nope. one's gone to jail. No one's been arrested. Yep. Like, no one's, like, and it's just, it seems to be this constant distraction game. And I don't want to be so disillusioned with the people running the planet, but... You, when you look at what's going on in the world today, I'm just like, well, I don't feel that I have too much of a say in any of it. So the way that I deal with that is I withdraw from it and I make the best of what I can. So I, I don't have political involvement. I don't talk about politics on my channel. And I'm trying to have as much fun as possible with my life. Mm. You know, you, you're here once, try and enjoy yourself. Uh, I I live on the cliffs in the middle of nowhere. I kind of do what I want anyway. You know, mm-hmm. I I don't like the, the the laws that I break aren't the kind of laws that are really abhorrent or immoral. Um, so I just yeah, I I've just kind of withdrawn from it all uh, because it's so much easier. Because otherwise you get stressed, and I think that was what happens a lot as well. You, you see people getting frothed up in the pub because of something they've read in the paper. And I'm like, that article was designed to make you do to that. To do exactly that. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, don't, I, don't, like, I don't read papers. I don't watch the news. None of that. But I, I used to think like that as well. I used to be like that. But now, uh, now I take the point of view that you know, 
how 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 dare they? Like how how dare they do what they're doing now? Because they're just people. They're no different to yeah. me and you. And they're elected to that position. And I don't feel like I don't feel like any party out there represents me. Do you know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. now, as a self-employed person, the whole the whole like business side of this is now right to the fore with me. You know, you've got to do your taxes every year. Yeah. And that that is one of the biggest motivating things for me because you see, as a as a self-employed person, when you're at this sort oh, of level where I'm at, fingers in your pocket, yeah. You get taxed on fucking everything multiple times. Mm-hmm. And it makes you think to yourself, so the harder I work, the more I'm getting taxed. And you just think yep. This is ridiculous. You, you, you kind of there's this there's this sort of, it. you wouldn't there's this mind little ground you saw where the money was going, and you felt good about it. If yeah, if I was uh, like that's my, what really my annoys me. The Danes have a really high tax rate, but they get free higher level education. Mm. Like uh, so, um, my uh, my Danish friend who I was living with, um, he uh, he was a student at the time. This was years ago when I was out there, and they not only do you go to university for free. They pay you a living wage while you're at university because wow. they understand that investing in their future is a good idea. So when the Danes come out of university, like every Danish person I met who was under 24 was at university and working in a bar or a cafe or a supermarket. Every Danish person I met who was over 25 was working in a field that they were really qualified in, really knew what they were doing with, mm. and they were happy to pay their high taxes because they had been given so much on the way up and they were still benefiting from it for everything else that the, that the Danish government was giving them. Mm. Um, whereas we don't see that. The, the tax, I, like, I was saying to someone the other day, like when I first moved out when I was you know, 17, 18, whatever it was, um, and I was paying £220 a month rent in a house in Exeter and uh, a pint cost you know, £1.20, and a tin of tuna cost 25 pence. And my minimum wage at that time, I think, was £5.90. I was like, the ratio for that, to what the minimum wage is now, so that house that I lived in, probably people are paying a grand for that room now. And the wages have not gone up. So if the, if the rent's gone up by 500%, and the wages have only gone up 100%, mm-hmm. there's something very wrong there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Right, Wusa. Deep breath. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I cheers to that, Michael. To yeah, cheers to that, Michael. You knew that would light a fire. Uh, Michael's got one more. He says, me again. What's the best ice cream to go with tinned apricots? <laughs> F- finish this sentence. Butterscotch. Rum and raisin. <laughs> there you go. Bosh. Sold. Cheers, Michael. Thank you, Paul. All right, last one of the clan questions. Dave, the sidecar dog. How are you doing, Dave? And Dave. Oh, hey, Dave. I speak to Dave quite a lot. How are you doing, buddy? Great, great lad, isn't he? And uh, he's got a really good Insta account as well, folks, if you've not followed. And Dave, the sidecar yeah, absolutely. dog. absolutely. Follow Dave. Uh, standard greetings to you both. As you're both bearded gods in the eyes of us mere mortals, what, thank you, what are your all time favourite songs, favourite albums? And last but not least, what's your favourite cheese? <laughs> um, uh, I can do this one. I can do this one. So I'm going to start off with my favourite album, um, which is uh, Nathaniel Ratliff and the Night Sweats, um, uh, and it's just their album called Nathaniel Ratliff and the Night Sweats. Right. It is, and as everything on there is an absolute banger. If you haven't heard of that band, look them up. Uh, like the two key songs to get you into them would be um, Sob, which is Son of a Bitch. Um, and Need Never Get Old. Just fucking glorious songs. What sort um, of music is it? Uh, it's like it's like bluegrass, but with a brass section, and oh, there's wow. a bit of a rock beat to it. It's so good. It's, they're honestly like, I, I, if you haven't heard of them, go check them out. They're absolute bangers. I, I, as soon as we're done with this, I will send you a link to Nathaniel Ratliff because... Yeah, I I want to I want to use one of their songs in um uh, uh, one of my things coming up. Um, awesome. Yeah, I, I use them in quite a lot of the stories that I put up. Um, uh, favorite song Jeez. of all time. All right. oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, favorite. Uh, yeah, I do. Favorite favorite song would be uh, "Wagon Wheel" by Old Crow Medicine Show. 
Um, uh, again, another bluegrass band. People think of a metalhead because I look like this. I like banjos and fiddles, mate. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm a redneck, not a metalhead. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, every time it comes on, I sing to it. It's just it's one of the best. Uh, and uh, favorite cheese. Um, I, I'm I'm partial to anything blue. Give me something smelly and mouldy, and uh, <laughs> have it with a steak sandwich. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, me favorite album, favorite songs. Uh, favorite songs going to be. I love a bit of blues. I love a bit of like soul. Um, Sweet Home Chicago. I think my mm. favorite album album of all time. The one I put on just to smile. Blues Brothers. It's got to be the Blues Brothers soundtrack. Just does it for me. In fact, I, I almost rewatched that last night because a clip on it came on, and I went, "I've watched that for years. I need to watch yeah, that yeah. again." Yeah. Uh, favorite cheese. Ooh. Oh, I'm going to go all like cosmopolitan here. My dad used to work in Norway. He was in the oil industry. And I remember him coming home with these big blocks, big squares of like this caramel cheese. It was some sort of goat's cheese, but I think my dad called it chocolate cheese. You could literally just cut big chunks of it and eat it. It was amazing. So my dad calls it chocolate cheese, but I thought it was a form of like caramel Goat's cheese. Norwegian caramel goat's cheese. I'll keep an eye out for that. I, I want to get back up into Scandinavia at some point. And yeah, it was the amazing. Food there is phenomenal. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I love Scandinavia. Absolutely. I think I think we have Viking in us. We must do. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, the rest of my family <laughs> are tiny. It's, it's me and my brother. We might have had a very tall postman. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but we don't, Dad, if you're watching. I'm definitely your son. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's it's like it's me, my brother, and like our third cousin. And in every family portrait, it's all these tiny people and just the three of us at the back, like <laughs> over everyone. There's some sort of genetic throwback. Um, mate, right, that's us done the, the Patreon ones. We've got uh, a couple over on Instagram, and I think there might be one over on Facebook. Are you all right? Well, like to I, get I don't have anywhere to go, but do do cool. tell me if I'm rambling or keeping you up. Mate, no, I'm loving it. I'm enjoying it. Um, do you need a natural a break? By the way, can I just stop you for a second? Thank you so much for having me on, man. This has been great. I'm really enjoying it. No, man, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. It's it's an absolute pleasure to chat with you. Um, Do you need to go and do a uh, Books on the Bog episode, or are you okay to carry on? Uh, I'll tell you what, actually, if you can edit out, I wouldn't mind running off a quick piss. Yeah, no problem. Right, folks, we'll do what needs to be done. You listen to these sponsor readouts, who this week are Ultimate Add-ons. Bit of spiel to read out for them. Ultimate add-ons are the premium manufacturer of mobile phone and action camera mounting solutions for motorcycles. With a kit for any bike and a proven track record of creating products that keep your devices safe, secure and easily accessible, the Ultimate add-ons product range is ideal for any rider from the commuter to the -the round-the-world adventurer. Why shell out on an expensive GPS system when you could use your smartphone, keeping it charged and within reach to take photos of your travels at the same time? Ultimate add-ons, waterproof, shockproof, and dustproof tough cases are available for all f- are available for all flagship smartphone models and are designed by riders for riders. Find out why Ride Magazine gives Ultimate Add-ons their coveted Best Buy certification. Keep riding this winter with Ultimate Add-ons. It's all about the journey. Now, if you head to Ultimate Add-ons, links down below, it's just Ultimate with A-D-D-O-N-S, all one word, ultimateaddons.com. Use the code TPOT1, that's TPOT with O-N-E at the end, Teapot1, then you'll get 10% off their entire product range. That also works for Dango Design UK as well. I've never had any vibration issues with the cases that I use. Uh, I've got one for my iPhone and I use the hex sort of strap. It's in the pedal cycle section. It's just like a ratchet strap, which allows you to pretty much attach it to absolutely anything. And then your, your case attaches to that. So a massive thank you to Ultimate Add-ons for their continued support. We are also sponsored by the Influencer Store. Now, Roger and Charlotte over at the Influencer Store, they've been doing my merch for teapot1.com for quite a few years now. I used to use the standard sort of print-on-demand type web-based ones. Uh, Yeah, it was nice and easy to do that, but the quality of the products were two or three washes and they fell apart they'd lose their shape and I wasn't really happy for my brand to be associated with that sort of quality so I was on the hunt for some better quality merch I saw Richie Vida stuff and thought that's really good nice quality really nice print like the designs and he pointed me in the direction of Roger and Charlotte over at the influencer store at the influencer store and they've been doing my merch 
ever since. I get the feedback from you guys when you spend your hard-earned money on the merch and you seem to be happy with it. If you're not, please do let me know and we can feed it back. But I've got some spiel to read out from them. The Influencer Store helps you build your brand, big or small, providing you with a solution and apparel. We help you to increase your fan base while supporting you with starting your own influencer clothing line with nothing more than just an idea or design. And there are no hidden costs. For more info, come check us out at influencerstore.co.uk or drop us an email at online at influencerstore.co.uk for more information. And lastly, a massive shout out to all of you over in the clan, over at uh, patreon.com forward slash teapot one could not do this without all your support folks we've got a fantastic community going on over there everyone's so supportive of each other we do the ride outs we do the meetups and obviously you guys get first choice for the questions on the podcast thank you so much for all your support i hope you're all still enjoying it let's get back to the podcast we're back in the room I just went outside and I found that uh, uh, one of the ponies um, uh, had uh, something wrong with its foot earlier, so I've got them in the yard to make sure they're okay. And they were all at the door listening in. We <laughs> 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 opened the door to these ponies there. <laughs> How many have you got? Uh, we've got four currently. We do them as a conservation thing. We look after them in the winter. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. Like I just like One of my daily duties is to just go and check on these ponies. Fantastic. Oh, mate. Wow. Um, I've seen somebody actually asks this. So, uh, in fact, it's this question. So we're over on uh, Instagram. If you're not following, it's at teapot1insta, folks. Obviously, I'll leave guys' links down below as well. Uh, this one is from MC. How can he be so satisfied and happy? What's the key? We need answers. Love from Sweden. Uh, th- this is the one that I mentioned, uh, and I'm sorry about this, but it is a it is a long answer, and I'll do it as quickly as I can. Um, I know exactly how finite life is. Uh, I I've, I've died before. Mm-hmm. Um, I when I was in my mid twenties, this is what I said earlier about like I spent my early teens, I'm sorry, late teens, early twenties, just not really doing much, getting stoned, working shit jobs, and just playing video games, and I wasn't doing anything with my life. Um, I uh, I made a bench out of scaffolding planks and I was living in this one house and the guy who was supposed to turn up with the van when I moved didn't turn up and I had to carry this bench. I was living in Exeter at the time. Um, I had to carry this bench about two miles across Exeter. Uh, the scaffolding planks are quite heavy. This whole thing is mm. a bit of a unit. I'm, you know, I'm a big guy. I can lift stuff. But after two miles of carrying an incredibly heavy thing, um, I woke up the next day with a lot of pain in my chest. And I went to the walk-in center thinking I pulled a muscle, but I was struggling to breathe. And uh, they said, oh, you should go to hospital. Um, they didn't tell me I should have called an ambulance, which one of my friends who was an ambulance tech told me I should have called. Um, he told me because he turned up in the hospital while I was there. So I walked to the hospital. Um, it's about a 20 minute walk. It took me about an hour. I walked in and I said, um, my chest hurts. I can't breathe in very well. Um, and I think I've, pulled a muscle and hurt my chest and they just went no you probably haven't let's x-ray you straight away i've never gone through an emergency ward quicker they just took me straight in and x-rayed me mm. and i'd lost 60 percent of my lung i basically torn my lung away from the pleural wall uh, so oh. kind of like imagine a balloon inside a balloon and there's mm-hmm. a little tear and the air is displaced so the balloon inside is getting smaller and smaller so there's this cavity of air and they said you're really lucky it's on your right side if it was on your left side you would have crushed your heart by now um uh, and i was like okay cool what do we do they said don't worry this is actually a common procedure it happens a lot to people who are very tall people who do a lot of heavy lifting um and at the time uh i'd good like i've gone up and down with my weight all my life i'd like lost a lot of weight um uh, because i you know wasn't looking after myself very well um and uh they said don't worry we're just going to take you in and it was a young doctor dealing with me and i, I said to him at the time i was like Said, um, have you done this before? He said, no, 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 it's my first time, but I'm not doing the operation. We're going to have a surgeon. I'm just going to be there. Observe. It was like, okay, cool. He was, he was younger than me. And they took me into the room. And what they do is they, they punch a sort of hole into your chest and they feed a tube in. And they, it's like a bicycle pump. They just displace the air so your lung comes mm-hmm. back up. Yeah. But they put in a guidance wire. Now, I found out this information afterwards, but... What happens is this wire kind of pushes through around the cavity, around your rib cage, 
and uh, it can interact with your spine. And he said, what usually happens is it rests on the nerve and uh, it doesn't always hit it, but there's like a one in 200 chance it will hit the nerve. But if that happens, it will just slow down your heart rate a bit. What happened to me was it hit that nerve and it was like a reset session. So you're awake during the operation. It's just a local anesthetic. And I'm talking to the guy and he's pushing this tube into my chest, chatting to me. And he just suddenly looks at me and goes, are you okay? And I went, I feel a bit weird, actually. And he went, hold on. And he like moved the wire a bit. He went, how do you feel now? And I went, I feel, and I was just gone. Like, um, and uh, I, from afterwards, I know that I was gone for a, just like about a minute. My heart wasn't beating. Mm. Um, and I, I, it's weird the things that you remember. I remember I saw green and yellow. It was like these big green fields, big yellow sky. And I saw the face of uh weirdly enough uh, she, she anointed herself as my goddaughter uh, she was my maths teacher's daughter she's a friend of mine for years a girl called kate um and i just remember seeing her face and like that's weird but that's all i remember about it and then the next thing i knew i opened my eyes and i was lying down you know i was sat up to start with and i was lying down i had all this stuff strapped to me and i had an oxygen mask on mm. and i opened my eyes and sort of looked around i went oh, I've woken up during the operation. I should go back to sleep. And I shut my eyes again. And then I suddenly went, I'm supposed to be awake during this operation. And I sat bolt upright and just started sprawling around. And then all these hands came over and grabbed me and sort of like pushed me back down. And then I remember the surgeon's head appearing over mine. And he's just going, this guy, guy, can you hear me? Can you hear me? And I just like gave him a thumbs up. And I was just like really spun out and wondering what was going on. And then they like, everything sort of calmed down and they, they sat me up. And, uh, like, it's like a sort of dentist chair. You sort of come up electronically and I'm just sat there and I'm going, I was like, what, what just happened? And he went, hold on, I'll tell you in a minute. And they're all like checking instruments and doing things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll say this in a minute. Um, but yeah, like they, 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 they I said, what happened? And they started explaining it to me. He said, well, you flatline. He said, your heart stopped. And that's when he started telling me the whole one in 200 chance of it hitting the nerve. And he said, it's a further one in 200 chance that react like that. He said, I've never seen it, but I've heard of it happening. And, he's, and I looked at my chest and I had like these patches strapped to me. And I said, well, did, did you use a defibrillator on me? And he said, no, you self-resuscitated. And I was like, what? He said, yeah, I've heard of it, but I've never seen it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. And he went, yeah, you can. He said, like, he said, that's probably like a one in 1,000 chance. So that's one in 200 times one in 200 times one in 1,000. And if you know anything about maths, that's a lot. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, so like I, I sort of, I, I popped back up and I was back in the room and then Paul, I, I always remember his name. His name was Andrew Short. That was the young doctor who'd seen me on the way in. They'd passed him the pump to displace the air. And this poor guy, he must've only been about 21. He's there with his pump going, <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever had experiences like this, but when you go through it, you, you get high. It's almost like, uh. It's very similar to a DMT high. So I was off my tits by the time I came back around. So after I yeah. had the initial conversation, all this stuff had hit me and I was like giggling, just going, this is ridiculous. And I looked at this doctor and I said, how's your first spontaneous pneumothorax going, Andrew Short? <laughs> <laughs> just carried on pumping. And yeah, they, they, they like checked everything. They got the lung back working again. They kept me in overnight for observation. Um, and I was just, I was just sort of sat there and it took a long time to process, but like realizing that literally it's that fragile, it can switch mm. off like that. Like that's yeah. it, you're done. Yeah. Um, and it like my initial response to it was get more out of life. Um, so that's with all the traveling, like going to Thailand, doing all this other stuff. I was like, I can't just fucking get stoned and play computer games for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, uh, and then it sort of changed more into a, like, it, it got, like, a bit hedonistic for a while. I probably went a bit too far with, like, sex, drugs, and various other things. I was just like, right, well, if this is fragile and I'm going to go, I might as well have as much fun as possible. Yeah, but, let's you know, live that, for the moment, baby. Yeah, but, you know, that, that can get fairly destructive. Um, so now mm -hmm. it's more about finding the thing that's, that's most meaningful and I've only really, I've been saying this to people lately, like, I've been talking about what I'm doing, what I kind of try and do is I try to act like I've got a terminal disease that I'm not telling people about. Um, 
and that's, that's not the case, by the way. There's not going to be some grand reveal here. Um, <laughs> because technically we all do. This is finite. Yeah. This is going to end. And regardless of your religious beliefs, almost all of them agree that you only get to do this once, this exact thing. Mm. Me being Guy, you being Bruce. You get to do it once. Like whether you've got an afterlife, whether you get reincarnated, whether the lights switch off and nothing happens. Yeah. You do this once. Th this moment only happens once. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, well, how would I act if that was the case? And like, I, I'm not like, I'm not trying to be hedonistic and frivolous when I say I want to sustain myself through doing the things that I find enjoyable, like talking about motorbikes, making people laugh, going to festivals. There's nothing I love more than taking someone who's never been to a festival before to their first festival. It's fucking amazing. Or someone who's never been on a bike before and putting them on their first bike and like yeah. taking yeah. them out for a ride on the back. Um, um, my mate Chrissy, I need to give a shout out to. She just passed her CBT a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and she's on her way to do her, her full license. And that started because she just got on the back of my bike one day and was like, this is amazing. I need to do that. Brilliant. So, yeah, um, to, to, like, to give a really short answer other than that long one to that question, it's because I know how fragile this all is and how short it all is. So I want to enjoy as many moments as possible. And, you know, you're going to have awful, painful, terrible things happen to your life. Like January was actually a really shit month for me. I had some really shit things happen, but I'm just like, I, I know that like, I, I, I said it in a video I made about it. It's like every good thing that's ever happened to me has led to every bad thing that's ever happened to me. And every bad thing that's ever happened to me has led to every good thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah. Like that's what made me be here right now. Um, so yeah, just, just to pr like whatever your situation is, like try and appreciate the fact that like you get to be here once. This is your chance. Control the things that you can control. Like, I don't want to sound preachy or anything, but yeah, I, <laughs> I used to joke with people. It would be really great if you had a machine in a hospital where on your 25th birthday, they took you in there, they sat you down, they strip you to this machine. They have a light switch on the wall and they hit the light switch and you turn off. And they hit the light switch back on again. And you come back on and someone looks at you and goes, it's that fragile. Like mm. that's, it can go like that. And yeah. I think, yeah, I don't want everyone to have to go through what I've been through to um, find that perspective. But I hope that more people can, because I think there's a lot of people that go through life, just kind of going through the motions and like missing a lot of, a lot of what's good out there. Yeah. Yeah. Live your life, brother. Live your life. Yeah, live your life. Live your life. Yeah, that's, exactly that's, that. that. That's exactly it. I, I had somebody on the podcast recently, and we were chatting about you know the ups and downs of of life, and you know life just it is life, isn't it? Life isn't always a bed of roses. There's more often yeah. than not there's a shite pile for you to wade through, drown in. But you know you either give up or you keep going. And they they came out with an expression. It was something like. If you imagine you're on a plane and the plane is taken off and it's on the way up, so you go through all the shit and the rain and the clouds and it's horrible. But at some point, you break through that and it's beautiful, bright blue yeah. sky, you know. And and I just thought to myself, fuck me, that's true, isn't it? It's like you just have to figure out the way that will allow you to keep going, and eventually you get through the bad times. At some point, and I think you have to come back down through don't it. Realize it. It's in their hand to control. There is, there's nothing better, like, it, fr from my work with the homeless. And unfortunately, a lot of those people are still in the same state. But every now and then, mm. like, I'll go back to Brighton to see a mate, and I'll be walking down the street, and someone will come up to me and go, hey, guy, do you remember me? And I'll look at them, and it will be a client that I had. And mm. they will look so much healthier and so much better, to the point that I almost don't recognize them. And they'll go, I don't do drugs anymore. I don't drink anymore. I've got a job. I've got a house, I've got my shit together, I've got a girlfriend, I've got a dog, and like they'll tell me just how great I was like, and then they'll say thank you. And I'm like, you don't need to thank me. You did all of that. Yeah. Like you can offer, like I learned this a lot with the homeless. You you can offer someone everything. You can give someone a place to live, a steady income, and everything that they need so they don't want for anything. And if they don't wanna, if they don't really, really want to put that effort in to fix their situation, they won't. Mm. But the people who do, they fix it and they get better. And it's it's like you you can get handouts and some people get a better luck of the draw. Some people do have it better than others just by dumb luck. But there's so much you can do as a person to make your life better. And 
Like, I, I think people don't realise the power they have just taking mm. responsibility for their own life. Yeah, completely agree. And it 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 can sound really wishy washy, but that is true. It, it, it is down to you. At the end of the day, it's down to you, isn't it? There's very yeah, few people I, out there I'm get not, given I'm not something trying to on get a plate. On my soapbox with this or tell people how to live their lives or anything. Like it's just it. It's what I feel. It's, it's what I feel has really worked for me, and it's mm. what I've seen work for so many other people. I, I have people on this podcast. Like this podcast is is nothing really to do with motorcycles. It's it's about the the live your life mantra. You know, I I have people on here who have a story to tell. And those people who have a story to tell and who have attained a, a, a level in life or on social media where they are, you know, they've attained that sort of celebrity type of status. Like, you know, you have, you have a following. You've, you've got a, a group of people that follow you. The common it, theme on everybody. Like, yeah, it is, it is strange getting noticed in the supermarket. Yeah. <laughs> the common theme amongst absolutely everybody, everybody, um, whether they've rode across the Atlantic, whether they've ridden a motorcycle around the world, whether they've beaten a disease, whatever it is, it's that. They've never given up. Everyone has the same mentality of you just keep going. Because when you give up, it's never happening. You've just got to keep going. Figure it out. No easy answers. No, it's, it's, it's in your hands. So I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot the username that asked that question. But yeah, like because uh, I have... It's weird. I have people messaging me and asking me for advice sometimes, and I don't. I don't really feel qualified to give advice mm. uh, on pretty much anything. Like I def, like I'm not a mechanic. I, I live in my way because it works for me. So people ask yeah. me about bikes, and they ask me for personal life advice, and they ask me for advice on how to grow on social media. And I'm like, I don't think I can tell you how to do any of those things. Um, uh, like I can tell you what's worked for me. It might not apply for you, but I think all the things that I just said, I think that's universal. Yeah. I think if you as an individual really just like focus on. Oh, oh, you're gone. Can you still hear me? Uh, hang on. Have I got. Tinterweb. Yeah, I've got, I've got Tinterweb here. Can you hear me? Oh, no. Kai, can you hear me? Hello. Oh, he's gone. There we go. Connecting to audio. Connected to audio. There we go. I think we're oh, back. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who that was. Sorry, I've got full that. signal at my end, so I don't know where yeah, that no, was. Yeah, no, here. I don't know what that was. But <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I think I was just in the middle of soliloquizing. But yeah, the, the, put it down short. Like, focus on what you can do, like, and and, and do that. Like, yeah. you know what can make your life better. Yeah. I, I've for, for me, something that has really raised its head with me is just being true to myself. You know, like I, I, I just, I just want to be, I want to be honest to me. I want to be honest to people. Yeah. I don't see the point in any bullshit anymore. Not, not like I was, you know, I wasn't a bloody compulsive liar or anything previously, but you know, I, I just, I don't see the point in saying anything I, that I don't believe in. So I'm just going to be true to me and integrity means younger, everything. When I was younger, I would definitely like over exaggerate stories mm. and things and like I, I that was because i hadn't had a lot of life experiences then and i wanted yeah. to seem like i had um and now <laughs> now i've had so many so i think people think i'm bullshitting with half of them because they look at me and they go there's no way you've done all that shit mm -hmm. i'm like no nah, I, I did and it was great <laughs> like and i would highly advise you go and do the same go and have as much adventures as you can yeah find yourself you know, find yourself and all that. But it's true, isn't it? By you way, need to figure out who you are. It's not in Goa. It's not in India in a temple no, somewhere. No, no, no. It's yeah. in you. You've just got to work out how to find it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Just figure out who you are and what what life makes you happy. Don't don't chase what you see other people are doing. Just figure out what works for you. Easier said than done, but, you know. 
you can do it. I had a wonderful interaction with a colleague of mine who's a location manager. He's my favorite person that I've ever worked with in the film industry, a friend of mine called Fred. And uh, we were doing a job last year and we had a guy on the job who was just miserable. He was making a really easy job really difficult and both of us were getting so frustrated by him and we were sat in the pub afterwards and we were just having a bitch session about how annoyed we were and i just turned around halfway through and i let's say because he, he's a he's a dj um uh, zen on records by the way if anyone's interested um uh uh and i said to him i was like it, the thing is fred is like you're not a location manager and i'm not a security manager you're a dj working as a location manager and at the time because that was still what I was trying to pursue I was like I'm a comedian working as a security manager and we're just doing this to get by at the moment and because of the writer's strikes I've had the success I've had with the motorbike stuff and his DJing stuff has hit massively and we were talking the other day about that conversation and he just turned around to me and went it's amazing what happens when you're not a negative dickhead and you just mm-hmm. focus on good stuff in life. <laughs> and yeah. It's just like, yeah, man, <laughs> that's put so well. If yeah. you just like make your own efforts to be like, sorry, I thought one of the ponies was coming in. Like if you, <laughs> if, you just make, if you just make your own effort and try and interact well with the world, you'll probably do all right. Shit stuff yep. will still happen to you, but you'll probably do all right. 100%. I totally agree, uh, agree with that. The power of the mind is phenomenal. Don't understand it, but... It, it works. Things work out if you have that attitude. Right, Absolutely. thank you very much for that. Uh, is it Livy, Livy Med MC? Thank you very much for your question. Next one, uh, Mark Barrett. Why haven't you got that wind turbine sorted yet? But what's your favourite road in the southwest? Mine's the road from St Ives to St Just, with no traffic about or co- cows in the road. You're Keep up the great work, mate, and I'll hopefully turbine. see you around. Oh, the wind turbine. I've heard you chat about this wind turbine. This is the wind turbine. Uh, I'll tell you exactly why. Because it didn't come with its own mounting pole. It is a weird Chinese fitting. I don't know how to weld. And I always <laughs> forget to go and buy a scaffolding pole that I can mount it to. And it's just basically, it's a lot of bother. It's one of those jobs that just kind of has fallen on the wayside. I need to buy myself a 20 foot scaffolding pole. I need to get a friend of mine who can weld. And I need to install it. And then I need to set it up. Like I've got um, uh, what used to be the bullpen there. I want to turn it into an off-grid power station and put wind and solar on it. Um, but the other thing is, like uh, for the past three years, when I was doing well with the security work, I was hardly ever here. I'd come here for the weekend when I had some time off and chill out, and then I'd run off. And then the money, I had a German girlfriend at the time. When I had spare money, I'd go to Berlin and go and see her. Um and I didn't invest a lot of money into the place. And then for the last uh, six months or whatever it's been, I've had absolutely no money and I've been putting everything into this. But it will get done. It'll get done one day. <laughs> right. Um, that's the Instagram ones. We've got one over on Facebook. There's loads of people saying they can't wait to listen and watch and that they follow your stuff. But there's one question amongst that. That is Richard Howard. He's already auctioned a part of his body for a sponsored tattoo. Is there anywhere he wouldn't get a tattoo? Come on, what's this then? Sponsored tattoo. Uh, so the next one is uh, actually for uh, super good bikers for autism and mental health motorbikes. Um, and that is going to be on my left butt cheek. Uh, I'll be doing a video about that soon. We've just been sorting out the back end stuff and I've been really hey. busy. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I've been really busy sorting out other things I'm doing with the channel. But the way that's going to work is I'm doing a raffle this time. It's all for charity. Uh, we're giving the tattoo artist a little bit to cover her materials. Um, Vault Tattoo in Lou, by the way, run by my amazing friend Kat. Uh, if you want tattoos in Cornwall, best place to go. Uh, she's done all of my tattoos. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, how this is going to work is people can pay £5 and they buy a raffle ticket and they submit an image. But if you submit your image... You can buy one ticket for five pounds, but you can set the quantity to 10 if you want and put 50 quid in. And then Mm -hmm. you've got a much higher chance of your image being picked. And what we'll do is uh, when all of the votes are in, we. Have you thought about this, Guy? Have you thought this through? So I have veto (laughs) powers. I am not having anything political, religious, or pornographic or any company logos. If you submit them, they will just, the money will still go to charity and I'll just chuck them out. You know, it's, it's easy. Like, so if you want to submit something that I definitely won't get tattooed and you want to buy 100 tickets and donate 500 quid to these great charities, absolutely 100% do that. 
Um, uh, but yeah, that, that'll be up and active soon. The, the one who's talking about, I will, uh, I'll show you if I can get the light right. Um, so when I had no money and I was first starting this, um, and I, I hit 10,000 followers and I thought I'll celebrate by auctioning off 10 square centimeters of my forearm, but I did it I as do. an eBay thing. I should have done it as a raffle really, but I did it as an eBay thing. So it was competitive on pricing. Um, and I had some great guys, by the way, um, uh, if you're watching Ozzy and Stefan, who have been really big supporters of me, like since the very early days and have been unbelievably helpful towards me, they were actually in a mini bidding war against each other. They're both ex servicemen and they wanted to have this tattoo honoring the Royal Marines, mm -hmm. uh, put on me. And I was, I was really honored that they, they wanted me to get that. However, they were beat by, and bearing in mind, I had bids from all over the world. <laughs> they were beat by the yeah. landowner's son, who, when I first did it, he put a reserve on the auction for a hundred pounds. He didn't tell me, I went up and saw him and he said, oh, I put a hundred pound reserve. And I was like, you bastard, I do not want you having my tattoo. And he went, oh no, I've only done it. So hopefully it will like big it up a bit. I was like, that's really nice of you, man, but I don't want to be accused of any shenanigans or things because we're friends. Um, but that, thank you, that's really cool of you. Um, and then on the night that the auction ended, I got an email. I'd just gone up to the house. Uh, to uh, I was out of power and I, I went up to go and use my laptop. So I'd gone up to the main farmhouse. And as I got off my bike, I got a little notification saying the auction has been won by my friend Alex. Mm -hmm. And I walked into the house and he was just sat there with this big shit eating grin on his face. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I thought you put a reserve of £100. And he went, I put another reserve on. <laughs> um, uh, so Alex is a computer programmer. I'll try and get that on the light there. You might be able to see QR code. That is a QR code. It is scannable. It does work. <laughs> and that QR code will take you to a website that says you have scanned a tattoo on Guy's arm. And then it has links to Alex is a computer programmer. Uh, he's got a game coming out in Steam soon called Europa. Um, uh, he has got links to his personal site. He's got links to my Instagram, and he also has links to the tattoo studio that did it. So it's Brilliant. actually, he chose something really nice and really cool. Um, he originally asked if he could get his face tattooed on there, but that is also on the veto list. I'm not getting names <laughs> or faces. So yeah, I want to have I want to have fun with it, but I also want to make a point of look, look particularly with this one. It's like this is for charity. I'm hundred percent. I'm willing to get absolutely anything tattooed there. But I have to put limitations on because, like, as I say, religious or political affiliations, businesses, like, it, it just makes no sense. Um, I don't think those are good things to get tattooed on you. And, you know, if I'm in a, if I'm in some country that's got public showers and I have something, yeah. Yeah. Like some sort of religious symbol on my ass, I think most people, some people might find that upsetting. That's and I don't enough. need to be doing that. Where do people yeah. go to uh, purchase a raffle or participate in this sponsored tattoo? You'll have to just watch my channel. We have got the website side of it working. I haven't done the video to market it yet, and I haven't sent the proposal to the charities yet. And okay. I apologize to everyone involved. I'm really disorganized. It takes me ages to do everything, um, but it will be up soon. So just keep your eyes on the channel. And as I say, all of this goes to Super Good Bikers for Autism and Mental Health Motorbikes, which are both great organizations. Nice one. All right, folks. Well, all the links for um, guys, excuse me, socials will all be down below. So make sure you like, follow, subscribe, all that. Dude, that's all the questions, mate. Three hours. Christ alive. Well, thank <laughs> you so much for having me. I, 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 I hope you're not going to have too much of a nightmare editing out my waffling. <laughs> there is no editing in this podcast other than when we Brilliant. went and had the toilet breaks. It is organic yeah. as it comes. So, yeah. Well, uh, I've got to tell you, Bruce, this has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I can't wait to share this with people. And uh, more importantly, as uh, I mentioned earlier, I want to do my own stuff. I'm hoping to come up and see you in person at some point and not just get some stuff done for socials, but actually spend some time with you. I, I love what you do. Um, and what first turned me on to you is I saw one of your ride videos and you do exactly what I do when you turn around a corner and you say something amazing. You go, look at this. Isn't this fantastic? <laughs> look at this that. Is oh, I love it. And like, that's all I do. Like every time I'm on a new road, I'll turn a corner. I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I'm doing this. Yeah. Mate, it's, I, I'm, I'm living my dream at the moment. And I'm, I, I, don't know, man. Like, I it's uh, appreciate 
every second I get to do this. So long may it last. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, mate. It genuinely has. And um, yeah, let's make let's make that happen. Let's um, do this meet up in person. And I look forward to working with you on this this little project that you've got. Can't I wait to see agree, it. Great man. Uh, yeah, like uh, never lose that gratitude. I hope I never lose it. I hope you never lose it. I hope everyone gets to do whatever's going to bring them the most joy in their life. Thank you so much, buddy. Absolute pleasure. Folks, hope you've enjoyed this one. Um, Make sure you check out All Guys Socials. All the links are down below there. Uh, Yeah, enjoyed it. Been a cracking one, this. Thank you very much, everybody. It's left a a like, a follow, (laughs) a review on the podcast. (laughs) Oh, man, no problem at all. No worries. Yeah, thanks very much to everybody who's left a review or a rating on Spotify or Apple. Uh, Again, I think we came in top two or top three of the motorcycle podcast. So fantastic. Beautiful. Thank you very much for all your support. Well Folks, deserved, keep doing man. your well thing. Deserved. Get on out there whenever you can. Look after those that you love. But most importantly, most importantly, live your life. Woo-ha. And right there, stay hydrated. Stay hydrated. <laughs> Cheers, Bruce. Mate, mint. Guy, that was awesome, pal.